Welcome everyone to Comics from the Multiverse episode 335. I am Peter and joining me as always is Matt. I'm here to shoot bubblegum and talk comic books. And I'm all out of bubblegum. The, the ferocity of which that was delivered. Nah. But there's no pants. Hey, I had a good football game this morning. I had two touchdowns. I intercepted it. I had a key fourth fourth down stoppage. I'm all hyped up and I haven't even had full caffeine yet. You guys are in for one. It's solicits day. So That was a lot of I words. Had... That was a lot of words that made no sense. This is a DC Comics <laughs> podcast, everyone. We get together, we talk about DC Comics that we read this week. Coming up on this week's show, we have Dark Crisis, The Big Bang, issue one. Superman Son of Kal-El issue 18, Batgirls 13, Wildcats issue 2, and Danger Street issue 1. So those are the books we're talking about, but we do also have solicits, as Matt alluded to, uh, March solicits, uh, so we'll be going through those. So yes, uh, nice, nice, busy week of uh, DC happenings. Um, and oh, I guess some news we probably should have talked about last week, which I'll, I'll throw in this week, uh, but okay. uh, we'll get into it. So yeah. Well, I, I don't have any particular preamble. Actually, though, although before we do get into things, uh, I should take this time at the start of the show, because not everyone listens to the very end of the show, to tell you about the Christmas schedule, because <laughs> that's next week. Smart. Yeah. So, uh, the day we normally record, of course, is Saturday, and that is Christmas Eve next week. So, we will not be recording on Saturday. Uh, you'll be getting the show pro... I think we're going to record on the Monday, and you'll get it on the Tuesday. That's giving me a look as if... I thought we were recording on Friday. Do you want... I mean, we can do Friday. Yeah, yeah. I, I thought I thought it was Friday. I thought it was... I thought New Year's was the one that was, I thought, pushed. A no, little. New Year's, I thought we were just doing on New Year's Eve. Okay. How, well, how do you have a completely different recollection of what we discussed than I do? It, I've had a week, Pete. It's been very busy <laughs> and very stressful. I thought we, yeah, I thought it was that we were going on, on Friday. We, we either, either way. Uh, I mean, if we're doing Friday, it's not even going to be late. Like, they don't even have to lie yeah. about it. Yeah, it's, I, I thought the late one was going to be the New Year's one. That's why. That's what I thought. No, I thought it was the other way around. Uh, I thought the Christmas one was going to be late, uh, and then New Year's would be normal uh, time. Oh. No, see, guys, isn't it fun? Isn't it fun when we, we hash out stuff live on air? I thought we did discuss this. This is what's so frustrating about it. It was done. <laughs> Sorry. Give, give, give me the tapes. I might have just agreed, and I did not know what I was agreeing to. Uh, All right, so we need to call it a Friday that next week. Yes, yes. Okay, all right. That's what I have penciled into my schedule. In that case, disregard everything that's just been said. The show will be out <laughs> as per usual. That's, that's why I didn't say anything, because I thought you were going to hit him with the, yeah, but New Year's, it's a, that's the wacky one. Because that was the one that was so kind of up in the air. So. I didn't think it was. We'll discuss it next week. We can decide next week what we're doing for the New Year's episode. Because yeah. but... <laughs> then we have to fit in the annual episode as well, somewhere mm -hmm. uh, around then. But, uh, yeah, okay. Well, in that case, it doesn't matter, everyone. We're, we're, it'll be out on normal time. If anything, maybe a little bit early so that it's out at a decent time. Yeah. Uh, Ready for, for that Christmas break. Yeah. So. You know, y'all need to get away from your family, listen to two guys. Maybe three if Connor can swing it. Uh, talk about DC Comics. I don't know, maybe free and free. I don't know. We'll have to check. Yeah. Uh, we'll did find did out. Santa give him the time off? He does. Uh, he's working a couple of days next week, but I can't remember if it, what two days it was or two or three days it was. Yeah. Uh, I think it may yeah. be off on the Friday. But anyway, we'll find out. Um, well, there you go. The, 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 <laughs> the, the, that was that was three minutes of of nothingness. Uh. So I like to think we're like Batman and Booster Gold, Pete. <laughs> we're just putting up with my constant nonsense. Uh, but even though we wasted all that time, there's still time for uh, Comixology Top 10, everyone. Don't you worry. That, that was my Hail Mary, and it failed. Yes. Now, Comixology Top 10. Uh, as per usual, we're looking at the, 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 the chart for Comixology as of right now, as we record. But they're separated by day, so we're looking at the Tuesday releases first, which is the DC day. So, do you have a guess? I'm going to call my shot, like Babe Ruth in the baseball game. I'm going to guess the number one spot for Tuesday was Batman Spawn number one. As Batman Spawn number one. Boom! You know how I know? Our, our, our good friend Mario, who we used to record with all those days ago, 
changed his Facebook profile pic to one of Batman and Spawn because he loves Spawn that much. Huh. So I was like, well, if Mario is excited for this and Tim's excited for it, then it's got to be. It's, it's pulling in the, the I don't want to call them casuals because they're big. They're not comic book casuals, but maybe the DC casuals. It's pulling them in. Uh, it might just be a case of Spawn has a dedicated fan base. Yeah. Batman has a pretty big dedicated fan base. Oh, and it's and it's McFarlane and Capullo, so that's a pretty heavy hitting team. Yeah. And I mean, though, that's a seven dollar book too. So, you know. Yeah. Having said that, though, I didn't consider reading it once. <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, even on a light week like this, it's just not my thing. Uh, I got enough Batman to mm. read, so. Yeah, you love your Batman. You always talk yeah, about your Batman. I is. probably have more Batman comics than anything else, and that bothers me. But <laughs> that's just because the creative teams. I can never drop it. Like every time I go to drop getting it physically, they're like, "Oh, Chips and Darcy's gonna write it." I was like, "Well, I guess I'm gonna keep buying it." <laughs> so uh, number two is the Dark Crisis on Infinite Earths Big Bang one shot. Okay, M- Mark Way, Dan Jurgens. Yeah. Number three yeah. is Danger Street issue one. Okay. Number four is Superman Son of Kal El. Number five is Wildcats, which is is not bad. I mean, part of no. part part of that says to me it's not a lot out this week. But at the same time, you know, it's still to come here. Number six, Batman I mean, Incorporated. Number, yeah, that, that's a dedicated base too, right? The Wildstorm folks. So you know, aye, but not more than uh, because this is the point I'm getting to is number mm-hmm. seven is Wonder Woman. Number eight is Batgirls. Yeah. Yeah, Wonder Woman in particular feels like it's low. It's been low for a while. Yeah, I mean, if I don't know, if that Harley Quinn book that was just covers had beat, had had beat them, I, I'd be worried. <laughs> you know. Uh, so number nine is I Am Batman, and then number ten is the Harley Quinn uh, yeah. uncovered uh, thing, uh, which did not beat any single issue. It did beat some trades, but that's fair enough. Whatever. Yeah. So. Um. If you're listening to this and you're reading Batman Incorporated, let me know how it is. I'm probably not going to have time to read it, but I am vaguely curious. Um, I don't know. I see a big ghost maker on the cover and I say, yeah, not I for know. me. Yeah, I know, but still, I'm just curious enough because I do like the concept of Batman Inc. Um, but, uh, yeah. Not today, saying Not today. Uh, All right, let's look at Wednesday. <laughs> what do you think number one book from Wednesday is? Oh, uh, let me pull these for the rest of them. Uh, what other books came out that weren't DC? And I'm getting there now. Uh, where is there an X-Men book? Was there an X-Men book? I'm looking, searching, searching. I'm going to go with uh, Legion of X number eight. Wrong! Dang it. Nope, there it is right there. It's, is it Dark Web X-Men? It is Dark Web X-Men, yeah. issue one. I it didn't look like an X book on the cover until I scrolled down and then I saw. So I was right though; it was an X book. Ah, uh, kind of. So it's kind of equally Spider Man, which you know is exactly lowering its uh, you know, sales potential. Any sellability, yeah. Uh, uh, number two is Legion of X issue eight. Uh, number three is Amazing Spider Man issue fifteen. Okay. And number four is Invincible Iron Man issue one. Uh, so a new series started this week by Jerry Duggan. Uh, I have been keeping an eye out for any new issue ones from any other company that I was wanting to try. Uh, I can't say I was tempted by a Jerry Duggan Iron Man. Iron I'm Man, let's see, what's the, I'm just gonna, just sounds like a, uh, more more Tony being Tony. So, if that's your thing, cool. I did enjoy Bendis' run when he was doing, um, what was it, International and in, in Invincible Iron Man. Um, that was a fun two reads, but I haven't read Iron Man since. Yeah. Uh, number five is Monica Rambo Photon issue one. Hey, cool. Uh, I guess they're. I mean, I don't know. When is the Captain Marvel sequel out? S- soonish, I would say. Um, it's I Ant-Man, watch Ms. Marvel. Ant Man 3's first, though. So I, yeah. it has to at least be like June or something like that. Right. So it's just called Marvels, right? The Marvels, yeah. Yeah, the Marvels. There we go. Yeah, but anyway, Monica's a one of the main characters, so mm-hmm. I guess that's why they're they've got given her many. Uh, Deadpool issue two is number six. Number seven is Nightclub issue one. This is a Mark Miller book, uh, so oh, this is fun. our first non Marvel here in the top ten. Uh, number eight is Planet Hulk Worldbreaker. 
So, okay. Cool. Issue two, I think that is the looks of it. Uh, number nine is A Vicious Circle, issue one. Uh, so to tell you what this is, because uh, it's from Boom. Um, this is Matt, Mattson Tomlin writing and Lee Bejero. Uh, sorry, Bejero. 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 Nailed it. Thank you. Uh, on art. So, uh, um, so it's about a futuristic that, assassin. That Matt's a guy. Wasn't the guy that did the, the Batman book we liked? I believe it was, yes. Yeah, okay. So, I know that name is familiar. Yeah, that's a... Uh, might be something of interest. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it, it, I have to, I have to go deep for that here on League of Comic Geeks. Oh, it's in a, it's in black and white, but the looks of it, judging from the preview yeah. pages. Yep, yeah. Looks super moody, as you expect from Behero. Honestly, yeah. Behero's art, uh, in black and white looks quite good. To be honest, mm-hmm. I've never, I don't think I've ever seen his stuff in black and white before. Well, that's not bad. Uh, so. Well, that sounds interesting. And at number 10 is Savage Avengers issue 8 uh, to round out the top 10. Um, just sort of looking ahead for if there's anything of interest sticking out to me from the, the rest of here. Not not really, to be honest. Right. Um, oh, they put a Spawn Compendium Volume 4. So, judging from Images Walking Dead Compendiums, yeah. I assume this is about 40 issues in paperback. Yeah, don't drop it on your foot. I, I, they've never appealed to me because because they're paperbacks that are that thick. You yeah. can't read them without the spine getting like heavily creased, yeah. and I'm just like, what's the appeal of that? I don't know. I hate it. Yeah, yeah. I remember someone saying, "How do you read those besides like laying on your bed, you know, with your legs kicked back like you're having a pajama party?" Oh, they're fine if they're hardcover. If you get like an omnibus, it's a hardcover. Like, yeah, you have mm-hmm. to put it in a no. table or something. But yeah, no, but I'm talking about the paperbacks because yeah. it's it's like trying to keep the page open. At a certain point, is is really difficult. Like, yeah, it collects uh, issue one hundred and fifty one to two hundred. So, so that's uh, forty nine. That's fifty. Fifty? Yeah. You said one fifty one to two hundred. Yeah, that's fifty issues. Man, I'm not good at math. <laughs> the, for, forget the the one fifty and two hundred. Just imagine it's one yes. to yeah fifty. That's fifty. Right. Right. Of course. <laughs> right. But, but I did quick subtraction. That's why I thought it was forty nine. So. Yeah, but one's included. So this is right. un- unlike actual math when you're talking comics. The the, right. the first numbers included. <laughs> right. 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 So anyway, uh, yeah. So there you go. That's the comicsology top ten for the week. There we go. Uh, it's, it's it's done. It's finished. Uh, your nightmare is over. Well, Thanks. mass mass nightmare. Everyone else is obviously having a grand old time. Yeah. Uh, all right. Let's go to solicits then. We got solicits for. For uh for March twenty twenty three. Yep. So March twenty twenty three. Uh we'll get into this. Uh all the super books seem to be first. We got Adventures of Superman, John Kent, issue one. This is the six issue miniseries that's following up Tom Taylor's book, which funny enough, I actually forgot today's issue was the last issue. I, just, I, I you know, I, I was like, oh wait a minute. Uh, yeah, I mean that that makes sense. Um kind of felt like a last issue, but I I yeah. Uh... I didn't remember that at the time either. It, well, I, I don't know if it did, to be honest. I don't know if I agree with that. But I, now that I'm complaining, it, obviously mm-hmm. it's leading into like, stuff in Action Comics uh, yeah. 1050. Uh, but I, I would disagree that that issue felt like a final issue. But we'll get into that later. Um, so yes, this is a Tom Taylor writing with Clayton Henry on art. I'm not mm-hmm. a big Clayton Henry guy, unfortunately, but... Uh, but if you look at the covers, those five heads are very... You know, John's five heads covered by a nice super hair. So, that's good. Ah, but Clayton Henry's only done the main cover. Yeah. But he's doing the art too, right? Yeah, but... Yeah, so if the art's, you know, if John's hair's covering the, the big foreheads, well, we should be okay. I like the head. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's still not good. I'm not... <laughs> I, uh... Still, still... I kind of like the idea that, that John was just... Clark's son, right? Like, there wasn't any of the... It always bothered me, like, Superboy had this tactile... When I say Superboy, Connor Kent, had this tactile telekinesis that only came up, like, for storyline reasons. So it's still kind of weird to me that John is going to have electric powers coming up. Like, like it makes sense, but I don't know. I just like the idea that, that John was just Superman's kid, and they had all the same powers in that way. So, um... It might take some time getting used to. 
Um, it's just one of those weird things where I don't... Whatever it is, it'll probably be gone relatively quickly. Yeah. And I don't think it's going to be a lasting thing. Would be my guess. Probably. Uh, Superman issue 2, uh, more Williamson and Campbell. Uh, you know, not much to really add here. Oh, homage cover to the original Superman 2 cover. Uh, from way, way, way back in the day. So that's fine. Uh, there's awkwardly a Henry Cavill cover. <laughs> I don't want to talk about it. Oh, we're, we're talking about it after the gear up. Yeah, I know. Uh, Action Comics 1053. Yeah. Uh, Maura Johnson's run. Happy, happy days. Mm-hmm. Um, so cool. Uh, some nice covers of this one, actually. Oh, I like the after Pacheco homage. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, there was that's... dedications at the end of all the comics this week. Yeah, that's that's super cool. I like, I like when they do that. Yeah. No, I like the Steve Beach cover. Uh, looks very. Is that the the black and white one? No, it's the red one. The red one. Go back. So the second one, I think. Yeah. Oh yeah, that was pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, so that's really cool. Uh, Superman Lost issue one. Obviously, we talked about this before when it was announced, but this is the Christopher Priest uh, mm -hmm. book that's starting. So very nice. Uh, it's interesting to have such a a big lineup of super books all yeah. sort of together. Uh, yeah. yeah, I wish there was a Supergirl book in there, but you know, yeah, maybe, maybe in due time. I feel like she's getting more of a spotlight lately, and she's showing up as as you know, I don't want to say backup character, but like like in Monkey Prince, you know, she shows up, mm -hmm. so she's showing up as as a character again. So so maybe one day soon. Oh, that's a good cover. Uh, we got Lazarus Planet, Revenge of the Gods, issue one. So this is the the four issue crossover thing that they're mm -hmm. doing uh, with G. Will Wilson, which is cool, but also just the regular Wonder Woman team as well, mm -hmm. uh, which is less than cool. Given that I'm not, you know, we all dropped that book, so <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, leave that as it is. Uh, uh, Lazarus Planet, Revenge of the Gods, issue two is also solicited here as well. Uh, you got Wonder Woman seven nine seven uh, solicited. And then you got Batman, One Bad Day, Raz Al Ghul, Issue 1. This is the Tom Taylor let's, issue. Let's go. <laughs> Matt's rather excited, apparently. Yes. Well, it's one of my favorite writers writing one of my favorite bad villains. So, that's a win-win. Season's been all pretty good so far. The, the, um, the, the, the quality has kept a reasonably yeah. st good standard, it has to be said. I wasn't expecting yeah. that so far. One of them ha is bound to suck. Like, <laughs> But it's yeah. not going to be this one. No, no, I doubt it'll be this yeah. one as well, but, like, yeah. one of them is bound to suck at some point. I'm and... a little worried about the Bane one, because Bane's one of those characters that can go either way, and it's Josh Williamson, so we, we all know. Like, I love Josh Williamson as a writer, but well, sometimes sometimes when he misses, it misses. If this so. is the one that, uh, you know, canonizes yeah. the Tom Hardy voice, then it can get yes. an easy pass in my book. <laughs> uh, next uh, up, we got Batman 133. Uh, so, you know, more of this. Oh, man. Yeah, an interesting cover with uh, well, it looks like a ghost Alfred sneaking up behind Batman. <laughs> no, it looks like he's making him dig his own grave at Sword Point. Oh, true. He's also Ooh, very dark. He's very red as well. I wonder yeah. if that's like a hint of like who he actually is or what's going on. Yeah, yeah. I was as everyone goes insane eventually, and then they belong to the terrifying Red Mask. But Gotham City has a new savior. He strikes in the shadows, exhumes the dead, and is known only as the Batman. Um. Yeah, so that sounds sounds just the amount of zany that I've come to expect from Zdarsky, like with the Zernar stuff. Mm. Um, so maybe this is more of that type of thing. Yeah, interesting. Uh, Detective Comics 1070, uh, continuing Ram V's run, yeah. of course. Not, not a big Joker fan, but that cover is pretty cool. If you, keep, if you keep going. It's two, two or you three. You mean on Batman? Uh, is that on Batman? Yeah, I think you're on Batman still. Oh, shit, that is on Batman. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that Batman cover. Uh, no, nah, if, if you look at the detective covers, there's a really... Yeah. The, the variant where it's like the big Barbados sort of yeah. behind Batman. It's like this painted gothic-looking cover. Very, very oh, nice. Oh, my God. That looks like a horror like novel cover. Yeah, it's very, very beautiful. That looks dope. Yeah. Uh, so that's cool. And then we got Batman the Joker of the Deadly Duel, issue 5. We have Multiversity. Harley screws up the DCU issue one. This is a six issue mini series starting in March from mm -hmm. writer Frank Thierry and Logan Farber. So, 
Yeah, uh, Harley's back in Kone for a long overdue reunion with old friends, old haunts, and an old time machine. You heard it right, a mysterious benefactor has left Harley a time machine, and after giving it about a half second of thought, she decides to take it for a joyride. What could go wrong, right? Funny you should ask, turns out a quick trip through time can screw up a few things, namely the entire DC universe. I'm kind of here for this. This seems like it could just be a fun, self-contained... The cover yes. is a play in that classic Flash cover, you know, where you've got uh-huh. Barry and Jay running down either yeah. side of the, the wall. The, the Flash of two worlds. Yeah, but you've got, uh, it's actually the time machine in the middle with Harley coming yeah. out with the hammer. So it's, I don't actually yeah. like yeah. the art, but the concept no. of the cover is yeah. interesting. Uh, the, the Connor cover, which is right after it, um, feel, it's got the whole DCU looks like chasing Harley. So almost as like an excuse for Connor to try to draw everybody that she could. Um, but yeah, yeah, not for me. That's all I'll say. Not for me. I might, depending on when, what, what's out this week, I might, you know, that week, I might pick that up. And uh, then you got Harley Quinn issue 28. Uh, no, Sweeney Boo on art. Yeah, uh, much better regular cover on this one. If that yeah. is the regular cover, you can't always tell for sure, but I assume it is. Mm-hmm. So, very nice. Yep. Yeah, so you got that, and then you got Unstoppable Doom Patrol issue one. My hey. my, what is this? Uh, Unstoppable Doom Patrol issue one uh, by Dennis Culver and art by Chris Burnham. Um, six issue mini series. After the events of Lazarus Planet, more people than ever have active uh, meta genes. Oh Mo- no! Most of these new meta humans have become misfits, shunned and imprisoned by a fearful society. They are hidden away in a dark, lost to a system that only sees them as weapons or guinea pigs. Ticking time bombs that can only be defused by the unstoppable Doom Patrol. Robot Man, Elastal Woman, and Negative Man are joined by their brand new teammates Beast Girl and Degenerate, and led by Crazy Jane's mysterious new alter, The Chief. Oh, so The Chief's actually one of Crazy Jane's uh, personalities now. On a mission of saving the world by saving the monsters. Hey, I'm all for a Doom Patrol book. Yeah, and Chris Burnham, uh, perfect for that kind of Doom Patrol-y, you know, kind of mid-century look. So even more of a surprise that this is in continuity. This is you know yeah. falling up after the uh, the mini event at the start of the year. Yeah. I'm actually quite surprised, but because I, I, I was surprised to see a book at all. But when I saw, it, I was expecting ah, this will just be like its own little pocket mm-hmm. somewhere. But no, it's actually uh, mm-hmm. referencing the, the greater universe. I so, am de- fascinated. Yeah. So Degenerate looks like a, kind of like a Killer Croc type dude, but more like made out of rock. Uh, yeah, not and, as tall, I would say, but yeah, he's got yeah. a bit of cragginess to him, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then Beast Girl looks like an actual, like, creature, like, not just like, she's not just purple, Yeah, you know, she's got tail, like a, horns, so. Yeah. I would say she's got like a, like a big squirrel tail. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. But then she's got like horns and she's got like a... Mm-hmm fangs and whatever yeah she looks very it's kind of cute and pleasant though she doesn't look a scary yeah. thing <laughs> no um yeah this is making me want to go back and actually watch doom patrol because i i got a season in and then yeah I should we go, got i i yeah. saw the first two seasons and really liked them and i just yeah. didn't get around to season three because season four is about to start uh this yeah. month so it's uh not that i wasn't enjoying it but it was a lot like we started to get to uh who's the strong man guy um Oh, uh, Flex, Flex Metallo. Flex Metallo. Yeah. We got to that, and then we got to, like, Flying Brains and stuff. I was like, all right, I gotta take a break. <laughs> it is a lot, a lot for me to take in right now, but, um, I, I, I liked it. I mean, so, I'll have to go. Uh, the actress that played Crazy Jane, really, really good. Like her. It, it, it's legit one of the best superhero TV mm-hmm. shows there is, just because, yeah. like, so, so many of them are just these generic CW things that yeah. it stands out as being actually really yeah good. And, and cyborg has more than just like oh my dad there's there's layers to him uh which is nice yeah so yeah uh, no, so, this, I'm, I'm cool that there's a doom patrol book out there i'm always curious about doom patrol so uh, definitely check this out yeah looking forward to it. uh the flash 794 uh jeremy adams um oh my goodness that cover's adorable oh yeah you get a little ivory in her costume yeah finally oh nice uh, I like it because it, it does mix the Kid Flash with Flash, but in a way that we haven't seen it before. Yeah, yeah. So, I like uh, it. So, yeah, it's a very pretty cover with, uh, she's, it's, it's like she's at the starting line of a race and, mm-hmm. like, uh, her father's, like, you know, next to her. 
Uh, but he's yeah. kind of got cut off of the edges of the, the page because it's yeah. not him that it's focusing on. It's a really nice uh, yeah. cover, I think. Uh, that's kind of cool. Uh, so yeah, Adam's Flash run continuing in March, which I am you know, enjoying more mm-hmm. and more as time goes on, I think. Yeah. Uh, Flash 795, also solicited here. Is this the same month? Uh, 321 yeah. and 3, yeah. Yeah, okay. Oh, Two weeks apart. That's, I think because it's the war, right? Yeah, the, yeah, that's right. They switched to every other week for right. uh, the one second war, which I guess is still happening. Um, so that's cool. Uh, also a nice cover. To, who's the main cover artist on these? Uh, t- Tarine Clark. Yeah, th- yeah, I like the look of these covers, actually. TC, yeah. What's the George Calamatis one look like? Yeah, that's okay. Very nineties, but that's the third one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No. And then you got DC Ruby issue two. I have nothing to say about that. So let's move on. Yeah. Uh, DC's Legion of Bloom issue one. Wait, what? <laughs> what the hell is this? this you is heard an, it. Oh, this is an eighty-page. This is one of these eighty-page anthology yeah. books. Okay. Okay. Uh, how do you announce the winter is coming to an end? You spring it on them. That's a terrible joke. Uh, welcome to the springtime with a celebration of DC's greatest, or sorry, greenest and greatest. As the flowers bloom, breathe in the swamps, things smell. Watch the blue beetles fly out from the Titans' west. Pick a Captain Carrot or two from the Floric Man's garden. Don't do that. But make do sure that. to avoid the poison ivy. The season may go by in a flash, but don't worry. Stories like this last forever. Oh, and Wonder Woman will be there too. Uh, yeah. So, so yeah, if you look at the cover, you've got a bunch of, you've got Swamp Thing, you've, what's the Green Lantern with the carrot head? Oh god, I forget his name. Yeah, I don't remember it, but yeah. He has like a, 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 his eyes on like the rootstock. Is it just um, me or is it weird that Fl- Floronic, uh, not Floronic, sorry, uh, Bloom's not on this, like I was like. That's what I thought it was, I thought this yeah. was going to be like, oh, this is what Bloom's up to now. No, that's not. Anyway, so uh, the creators we got involved, uh, writers Ashley Allen, Julio Anta, Calvin Kasuki. Uh, Travis Moore, Kenny Porter, Kevin Scott, and Zach Thompson with art by including Isaac Goodhart, Brian Level, Travis Moore, uh, Jacoby Salcedo, Hayden Sherman, uh, Atigan Ilhan, and more. So, uh, definitely not like a like a sort of lineup of star creators there. This is mostly no. the names I don't know. <laughs> Although, yeah. Like I recognize Travis Moore and Kevin Scott. Uh, yeah. That's about it, I think. There's a Mike Perkins cover. I must find now which one. Oh, there it is. It's okay. just, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I yeah, doubt... this is something I would be inclined to read if it's not a busy week. I you know? doubt I'll look at it, but yeah. I'm, I mean, I'm... you had me at Swamp Thing and Ivy because you know I like that. So, but but yeah, this is, seems like a mixed bag because it's not like they're they're kind of saying what's going on, like. You don't have a lot to go off of with breathing that swamp thing smell. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, that's the thing though. It's going. It's going to be like ten eight page stories. Mm-hmm. So I I wouldn't get your hopes up of it, them being that in depth. If I'm honest. Yeah. Uh, next up, here's something else that's new. Uh, Waller versus Wildstorm issue one. This is a four mm-hmm. issue mini, but notably, this is a Prestige Plus book, meaning this is the you know the, the black label style. Uh, it doesn't say that it's black label. But that's typically the books that have had it, that format. It feels very black label because of the prestige and also that it's uh, set in the early 80s. Yeah, so, so let me read the uh, description here. Uh, set in the early 1980s as the Cold War stubbornly refuses to thaw, a new battle heats up for the soul of the intelligence ag- agency Checkmate. As the agency's superheroic public face, Jackson King, a.k.a. the Armored Battalion, former leader of Stormwatch and the symbol of American might, has long suspected that Adeline Kane is up to dirty tricks overseas, engineering horrors that betray everything he believes about service to one's country. But King doesn't know that Kane has a clever new ally, an ambitious young woman named Amanda Waller. Uh, she has her own ideas about how metahumans can serve the country, and honour, dignity, and long lives don't factor into them. Yeah, we know, it's called bombs and necks. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah, this is a... Uh... This is interesting. I, I don't really care that much about Wildstorm necessarily as a as an entity, but as like a sort of like young Amanda Waller, how she rises up through the ranks, like gritty story. Maybe mm-hmm. it's maybe it could be good. I don't know. Um, 
I just like that also the cover gives it that like the Fortnite's cover gives it that grittiness that I feel like this would have. Mm -hmm. You know? Like I can feel like this has like commando vibes kind of. So yeah. So yeah, four issues, prestige plus. It's not it's not mm -hmm. big in terms of page count, but it's the bigger pages. Yeah. Um yeah, I'm curious. Uh, Spencer Ackerman and Evan and Narcissi are writing together, and then Jesus Marino is on the art. So, yeah, that, that should be an interesting one to check out. Uh, I, I don't really know how, how I feel about it or what I'll expect from it, but interesting. Oh boy, they're soliciting Swamp Thing Green Hell issue three. Yes, let's go. I mean, issue two just got solicited or well, resolicited finally. So right. this maybe this maybe implies that they had kind of it in the tank, and for whatever reason they were waiting until. Mm -hmm. you know it was all done but this is this is issue three of three uh issue one was great i'm probably gonna have to go back and reread it before issue two because it's been so 100%. goddamn long 100 <laughs> percent. but uh nice to see that f3 is following quickly and we're not waiting another you know two years almost so good stuff uh next up static shadows of dakota issue two uh this is the six issue static miniseries uh second issue then we got icon versus hardware issue two Again, uh, another one of the. Uh... Hey, um, Milestone has their own designation now, so that's cool. Yeah, yeah, they've got these little series. More of and then it's got uh, the 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 trade for uh, Blood Syndicate season one, uh, and Duo by Greg Pak. Mm -hmm. So that's cool. And then there's a Batman One Bad Day box set, which nice. Uh, will include all of the One Bad Day books. Um, well. Actually, no, it, would, it would have to. One by day hardcover. 184 pages. Oh, yeah. Oh, maybe not. Yeah, 184 pages ain't all of them. 184 pages ain't even close to all of them. So um, maybe that was a typo because it does say the Riddler, Two Face, Penguin, Mr. Freeze. So we've gotten those ones so far. Aye, but, Catwoman being no, Clay no, Face. No, Matt, Matt, pages, Matt, Matt, yeah. Look at the, the, the image. It says The Killing Joke is one of the books in there. Yeah, so it says you had a bad day and everything changed, and the pages of the iconic story of the killing joke, Batman's ultimate foe, changed. Now, some of them... Yeah, I don't... Oh, yeah. So it's Riddler and the killing joke. But that seems like a waste. Yeah. What are they doing? They're selling an empty box with they're selling, yeah. they're selling you a box with two books with room for the rest of the hardcovers that you have to buy separately. Yeah, and those two books are 45 bucks. I don't know what they're doing. Yeah, that's weird. Because this image is weird. It's got like a big mm -hmm. white space in between these two books. Yeah. Uh, that's very, very odd. Yeah, and those are the two. The Killing Joke and The Riddler. So they're going to re-release all the One Bad Days as individual hardcovers, rather than doing... Well, and here's the Riddler one that is uh, solicited right underneath it. Oh yeah, the hardcover. So. Um, mm -hmm. Which is... I mean, I wasn't necessarily expecting... Like, I assume there'll eventually be some sort of big omnibus that has all of mm -hmm. them, because obviously they're 80 pages or whatever each. But I thought the trades would at least be like bundling them into like, you know... Either two, two. Big, two batches of yeah. four, or maybe like any three, if like they split up evenly that way somehow. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but okay. Having to buy all eight of them individually in hardcover is a bit of a dick move. Big um, time. Yeah. So that's eighteen dollars, meaning that assuming the killing joke's worth about the same, which it kind of is, because it's not a big page count either. Um, mm -hmm. you're paying what? You're paying like nine dollars for the box. <laughs> And that's assuming you don't already have Killing Joke and you want it in the same trade dress as mm -hmm. these other One Bad Day books. Even though Killing Joke's not actually a One Bad Day book. Even, but, you know. They're, they're, I don't know. They're, they're, I don't really like a lot of this. This solicit here for this box thing is not, is not uh, filling me with particular joy. Anyway, some more trades here. Uh, Batman Detective Comics Volume 4, Riddle Me This. Uh, this is the arc that came after the tower uh, with Tamaki and mm -hmm. the co-writer. So that's wrapping up that run. About Donovan's daughter. Uh-huh. Um, mm -hmm. And then you got Jurassic League uh, in trade. There you, go. you got Absolute Superman for all seasons. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh cool. man. 
I want this, but a hundred dollars is a lot. I mean, it's an absolute. No, I know that, but like, I just have to restrain myself. So, and then you got Superman 85th Anniversary Collection, uh, which is a 496 page soft cover uh, yeah. with a lot of different stories in it. Uh, yeah, I, I've never really been big in these like, anthology books that just do like random single issues mm-hmm. that are prominent. So you, you technically get a lot of comics, but they're all just like, you know. Yeah, it's kind of scattershot across them, but I'm, all, I'm sure they're all like big moments in Superman's history over 85 years. Yeah, but I wouldn't want to read any of them this way, though. So that's, that's for, this for True. me is, is worthless. I, I, I would, True. you know, I would, I would never buy something like this, mm-hmm. but uh, Superman Space Age hardcover. Uh, coming out. Yep. Uh, then you got Shazam: Power of Hope. This is the Paul Denny and Alex Ross uh, yep. book. I remember knowing this existed, uh, yep. but it was very hard to come by. So it was nice that they're reprinting it. I guess. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's like uh, we're getting a lot of Shazam in March uh, for yeah. obvious reasons. Because I think there's because there's a Superman one that was a similar format. There was because mm-hmm. like this is only sixty four pages. There was a Superman yeah. one. With Alex Ross, I can't remember the name of it, but it was the same format. Yeah, they also did the, all the Justice ones, or the Justice League. No, 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 that's def- no, 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 that was very different. That was like a twelve no, issue book. Okay. This this Superman book, the pages were huge. It was like a it was okay. released in this very specific format, and I think the Shazam okay. book was the same thing. Um, yeah. If I if I look at the uh, aye. So anyway, I so. I mean, that's cool. It's cool they're reprinting it. Mm-hmm. Uh, there you got Shazam, the Monster Society of Evil, which is one of the few Shazam trades that does seem to get reprinted. Uh, this is a hardcover version. Uh, this is the one by Jeff Smith. Uh, so that's cool. Then you get Fan Club Batman Squad, written and illustrated by Jim Benton. This is one of the young adult uh, graphic novel releases. And then we're back out of the single issues uh, for March. Where we got Batgirls issue 16. Uh, mm-hmm. So that's continuing there. Uh, decent cast, front cover. Uh, Mad Hatter implications on some of those covers. See, yep, so this is where mine stopped coming in. I have covers all the way through until now. So fun, fun times. Okay. <laughs> Batman 357 facsimile edition. Uh, Batman Incorporated issue 6. Batman Superman World's Finest issue 13. Uh, that's a fun cover with uh, Metamorpho on it. More on him later. Mm-hmm. Uh, we got Batman Gotham Knights Gilded City issue 6, so that's wrapping that up. Uh, is it, actually? It is, yeah. Um, then we got Batman Adventures Continues Season 3, issue 3. Batman okay. The Audio Adventures issue 7. I'm just running through these quite quickly because it's mm-hmm. just a bunch of... Uh, these books we don't really have much to say about. Uh, right. Black Adam issue 9. Uh, with an excellent front cover, you know, I, I have stopped reading that book, but I cannot deny those those uh, main covers have been stunning by and large. Mm-hmm. Uh, Blue Beetle Graduation Day issue five, so penultimate issue in that miniseries. Uh, Catwoman issue fifty three, uh, and it's got a weird cover where she's got or like her ears have become horns. Oh boy! Uh, also very shiny. It's a very shiny looking outfit. Uh, Danger Street issue four. Uh, so more than that. Oh, that is a cover on that as well. Jeez, it's like a black and white image of the police officer mm-hmm. lady, but there's just red coming down her face for blood. It it looks quite. It's a very Sin City esque, is what you're saying. Very. Uh, I don't know if I'd say that. Okay. Uh. Uh, Dark Knights of Steel issue ten. Uh, that's taken ages to come out. You know that. Yeah. <laughs> like like all, for some reason the pacing on that just is completely grinded. To a halt. Uh, Fables issue 159 is solicited. Uh, GCPD, the Blue Wall, issue 6. So that's the final issue mm-hmm. uh, of that mini. Yeah. Uh, and we have Gotham City, year 1, issue 6. So final issue awesome. of that as well in March. Yeah. Uh, we got Harley Quinn, the animated series Legion of Bats, issue 6. We mm-hmm. have Justice Society of America, issue 5. So that's cool. Uh, Looney Tunes, issue 271. Mad Magazine issue 31, Monkey Prince issue 12, which... Final issue? 
It doesn't actually nope. say Phenolestia. It doesn't, does it? Oh. I always, always thought it was of 12, so maybe they're giving it um more time. Maybe, or maybe they're just neglecting to tell us that it's the final issue. Because yeah. they've, they've done that once or twice not too long ago. Yeah. So it wouldn't surprise me. Uh, Nightwing issue 102. Mm-hmm. Um, which notably is a $5.40 page book. So is this getting backups starting soon? Like after issue 100? Doesn't seem like it. It's the only creators they have are Tom Taylor and Travis Moore. Uh, true. With Renando on the cover, so... But it's, it's got the extra page count, yeah. and it's got the extra price yeah. to uh, go along with it, so it seems like it's not a mistake. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, well, uh, we'll see, we'll see. Not that more Nightwing's a bad thing. Uh, no. Poison Ivy issue 10, coming out. Uh, and mm-hmm. we got Punchline, the Gotham game. I forgot Punchline had a book right now, to be honest. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, Stargirl, the Lost Children, issue 5, so that's the penultimate issue of the uh, Stargirl mini. And we got Batman and Scooby-Doo Mysteries issue 6. The Joker, The Man Who Stopped Laughing issue 6. Uh, a lot of minis ending in March, I'm noticing here. Uh, yeah. The Sandman Universe Dead Boy Detectives issue 4. Tim Drake Robin issue 7. Uh, which is sadly not Rosmo on art, so uh, Connor won't be made to you know, suffer. Dang, what if he actually likes it by then? Yeah, that'd be a horrible thing. Horrible, horrible thing. Well, Wildcats issue 5 is out. Uh, and then that wraps up the single issues. And from there, we go into just whatever the rest of the trades are. Yeah, Batman, Fear, the Fear State Saga uh, is a 320-page uh, paperback, which has the, the main Batman arc of mm-hmm. 112 to 117, but also uh, all those Secret Files issues and the Alpha and Omega that came out mm-hmm. for it. So... I don't know if that's necessarily everything, but it's definitely the the main chunk of it. It's it's the main Batman stuff for sure. Yeah. So well, that's the thing though. I would argue that you kind of need the build to it for it. Like, so I would imagine that if there's ever an omnibus, it probably just yeah. be, it would probably just be all of Titan's run to be honest. But if you're ever going to do a Fear State omnibus, you'd have to include right. like the previous arc or two that builds up to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, Catwoman Volume Two uh, trades out. Uh, Gotham Future State Gotham Volume Three. Uh, Justice League Volume 1 Prisms, this is the Bendis Justice League. Uh, the Volume 3 of that in hardcover, solicited. And then you got Legends of the Dark Knight, uh, Jose Luis Garcia Lopez, which is, I believe, a, a reprint, or at least a new version of one they already did, because I remember this coming out like a decade ago. So, I don't know if the contents are any different, or if it's just a, just a reprint with a different cover. Uh, Superman Son of Kal-El Volume 1 Paperback. Phantom Stranger Omnibus. Uh, it's always nice when they do an omnibus for something that doesn't seem like yeah. they would get one. Uh, but that's twelve hundred pages. That's a Oof. hefty amount. Uh, you're getting Phantom Stranger so many series from nineteen fifty two. That's six issues, and then you're getting the series that started in nineteen sixty nine that has forty one issues, and then you've got a few issues of Batman Brave and the Bold and a few other like standalones and small mini series so seems to be like yeah, a pretty of the swamp thing went yeah Saga of the swamp thing went through 13 too yeah so, uh, massive seems to be i mean without looking it up because i'm sure maybe some people argue this but it seems to be fairly comprehensive of here's everything you would need for phantom strange up until i don't know like at least the start of the century mm-hmm. by the looks of it well, yep. uh, top 10 compendium uh, coming out and yep. uh, that's actually the last thing there so there you go that is the March solicits which a uh, couple of interesting minis thrown in there Not nothing earth shattering but uh, I'm excited about the Doom Patrol book yeah the Doom Patrol one's probably the biggest uh, surprise um, seems like a lot of fun so uh, and then we have the, all the fallout from Lazarus Planet. So that should be a, a lot of, you know, seems like a little bit of a of a shift. Yeah. Storytelling. Storytelling-wise, anyways. So, uh, there you go. Uh, I, I meant to bring this up last week. Uh, this uh, the, the movie stuff that I, I just kind of, like, mm-hmm. brushed past. So I thought I'd mention it a little bit, especially since there's been ad- more stuff added to it this week, uh, which is that... Henry Cavill, 
left Witcher. Mm-hmm. And it was only speculation, but part of the speculation was is that he left Witcher because he believed he was getting more Superman projects again. Mm-hmm. Um, other stories are saying that he wasn't happy with the how they were adapting the, the books because he's actually a big fan of the books and uh, had problems with what they were doing creatively. Uh, but regardless, it seemed like he was coming back based on uh, a cameo and sort of like some teases. Mm-hmm. And now, because James Gunn and his partner are in this new role where they're, you know, shepherding yeah. the entire thing, they've basically decided that outside of Matt Reeves' Batman and the weird Joker musical that's happening that are separate, the entire DC universe is being reset and they are starting fresh, uh, which I think is the right choice. Yeah. It is kind of funny, though, to like find this out because it's like, wait, you've got like three or four movies still coming out that are part of this current universe, which makes them all feel like just instantly skippable you know for, just so, from uh a... where does this put like his stuff though like the gun suicide squad and peacemaker they're probably yeah not in it yeah man yeah okay. I, I i think you know his suicide squad definitely isn't i think peacemaker just gets to be its own little weird offshoot Dang. on hbo max and to right. be honest Given how HBO Max is cancelling stuff left and right, I don't think it's going to be uh, existing past. I should probably anyway. finish that before they decide to take it away. Uh, that's the other thing. The yeah, they're, they're taking stuff away from the service. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it's uh, it's kind of wild. Uh, I do think it's the right choice, but part of that was that they basically told Henry Cavill, "Sorry, but uh, we're going to go with completely a new cast and new people and all the roles." And uh, James Gunn's actually writing a Superman movie. Uh, is the story right now? And his his words to Henry Cavill was that they want to focus on a younger Clark, but it's not an origin, right? So and you know and, and Cavill kind of kind of said without saying that Cavill's kind of too old for what version of Clark they want to play with, um, which bums me out because I feel like Cavill never got to shine a Superman because he had he had it almost like there were moments where he had to but. Because of the creative decisions that were made by a person that will remain nameless, we never got to feel like, for me as a Superman fan, he never got to feel like Superman up there on the screen. Um, kind of came close in some Justice League, you know, the the theatrical cut. There was a little bit here and there, but yeah, it was, it's a bummer all around. And I feel bad for Henry because he seemed to like being Superman. I just wish they had let him be actual Superman. Yeah, I don't disagree with that, but fundamentally, I think that if if they if they want to have a shared universe of some kind and they've got yep. gun actually trying to like make it coherent mm-hmm. and make it all work together, then I don't think you can keep any elements of the prior films. And you know that the other yeah. bit of news from last week as well was the fact that Wonder Woman three has also been completely cancelled. Yep. And uh, like I know Patty Jenkins put um, a statement sort of contradicting not not anything like the important details weren't being contradicted. Like it, you know right. it's not happening. It'd be more just like the circumstances of which like she was let go or she decided to leave, mm-hmm. whatever it might have been. Honestly, at this point, it doesn't really matter. Uh, it, was, it was kind of a mercy because I saw 84. Yeah, 84 yeah. was so bad and downright problematic in parts that, yeah. <laughs> frankly, I, I'm not that, that fussed that we're not getting more of that Wonder Woman either. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And But yeah, it's kind of funny. Like I wasn't excited for any of these movies coming out anyway, but you look at Shazam 2, Aquaman 2, and this Flash movie, which, you know, may see the light of day someday. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like, it all just feels pointless. I, I mean, a story came out this week that they cut cameos from both Wonder Woman and Superman from the Flash movie, which yeah. is like, okay. But it's not like anything else that it's going to carry over either. So yeah. <laughs> why did you need to? Um, Yeah. So what about the Blue Beetle? So I saw a poster for Blue Beetle. Oh yeah, that's the other one. That's the fourth one, yeah. Blue Beetle's apparently still coming out. Yeah. So, yeah, Shazam, I mean, it'll be fine. I like the first Shazam. I'll go see the second one, but I don't know if I can be, you know, plus to go see Aquaman. Because, you know, I I remember on the review, if, if it's still up, you can watch me be, like, way too positive about that movie. And anytime I've had a chance to rewatch it, I've passed. Just because I'm like, it's, it's, it's whatever. Um, so, but Shazam is one that I, I do enjoy that first movie for the most part. So, uh, and I got a trailer for the second one again last night at the theater, at the movies. 
Um, looks looks like it could be good, but but yeah, all right, man. DC is kind of a mess right now across all fronts. I mean, so, for for me, for, for me, they all felt pointless anyway at this point because every, everything feels so. Everything felt so hit and miss, and like so many parts were missing, and they already were left or done, and the the fan base was all over the place because some people want a fresh start, some people want Snyder's universe to continue for some reason. Like this news just kind of solidifies that yeah, it is already done, and we're yep. just kind of like waiting out this zombie phase where these last projects that were already made can come out and just like mm-hmm. you know. Honestly, I am shocked Blue Beetle's coming out because it's a, it's the same size as Batgirl, but for some reason, right? Batgirl get canned and Blue Beetle gets to... Because Blue Beetle was also meant to be HBO Max and now it's going to be right. theatrical. So I, why that gets I that wonder, treatment, I don't know. I wonder if the thing with Batgirl is maybe they will do a different version of Batgirl and maybe they want to save that. They don't want to have competing because i can see batgirl as a character no no that... a, no absolutely not because yeah. all the decisions being made now by james gunn and that they weren't there when batgirl got canned so the, the decision, decision to can batgirl <sighs> has nothing to do with what anything is going to happen I've, apparently yeah, james gunn was, and co are sense. presenting their plans to warner yeah. uh at the start of the year that's apparently something that's happening so Anything that's about to happen because of that, assuming right. that they like the plans and they keep them on in the jobs and all that stuff. Has nothing to do with what they've done before. Has nothing to do with any decisions they've made up until this point. Oh, man. So, I can see James Gunn doing a, a, a Batgirl story, you know, pretty effectively. So, may, maybe we'll still get that. I don't know. It's, it's a mess right now, man. And there's people out there that are excited for stuff, and I get it. But, like, I feel like they were more, like, disappointed that we're not getting that Kevin Conroy cameo that I guess that was apparently shot for um, one of these movies. I think it was Flash or something. Maybe it was Michael Keaton. I'm not sure. Something got canned um, and people are real upset about it. But, you know, like that sucks. But at the same time, a fresh start, I think, is needed. Um, And try, you know, I hope they don't try to do the whole massive big shared universe thing. And just kind of let some of them, like Matt Reeves, Batman, kind of just breathe um, and let them tell the stories they want to tell without feeling the need to, to wrap into something. Well, no, I mean, uh, already, they've already said that there's going to be a shared universe. It's just that Batman's staying separate. Uh, that was, right, but... This version of Batman's staying separate, I should say. Right, right, right. But what I'm saying is, like, whereas, like, Suicide Squad felt like it was part of a shared universe, but I didn't feel like it was, you know, building to anything else, Right. So, like, that Harley felt vaguely familiar to the, the Harley that we had before. Um, you know, uh, and that just, like, I don't want them chasing the Marvel thing. Because, you know, that took 20 years to, to and now we're, we're kind of feeling the the stress from that right now. Uh, where everything just feels like the next piece. It's not even just so, 20 years, though. I mean, yeah. Well, that's the problem, though, is they don't feel like the next piece. I, it, would, it would be better if it felt like the next piece of the, of the whole puzzle. Right now, it just feels like repetitive and aimless and just mm-hmm. kind of hollow I, 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 well what i mean by the next piece is like oh we have to have something out so oh, this sure. is just the next one not that it's the next in the story because i still have no idea and i've had arguments with a good friend about this but he reads way into everything he's like oh well you know with, with phase one we didn't know where it was going i was like yes we did we know it was building to avengers right like with what everything that's been going on right now i have no idea where any of this stuff stands um so and I just want to sit and enjoy a Superman movie, you know, just let Superman be Superman. That's all I care about right now. And I trust James Gunn in that because he made us fall in love with a character named Peter Quill, which was two synonyms for, you know what? Um, so, you know, uh, I just, just let the man cook and let's see what he's got. And then I'm just going to ignore most of everything else that comes out until that comes out. Yeah. All right. I, I I mean, I'm just kind of sick of superhero movies for the most part right now, to be honest, but uh, it would be nice to be excited for a couple of them if they do announce something mm-hmm. fun. And even if they do announce something good, they're going to have to announce killer creative people behind it to get me to, like, move the needle yeah. at all. What's, what, what, let's just play hypothetical real quick. What's a director's name that would get you excited for Superman, written by James Gunn? Let's say, let's, let's say James Gunn's too busy to direct, because he's writing and he's overseeing... 
Who, who do you get I, to direct? I don't think I'd want that would make you excited. I don't think I'd want James going to do a Superman movie anyway. Mm-hmm. I don't think he's ready for it. Okay. Uh, my first answer is Brad Bird, but mm-hmm. okay. I see that. I'm still I'm still in the Matthew Vaughn camp. I'd like to see what he does, um, with a bit of restraint. Uh, so, uh, because I, I did love X Men First Class, and I do like Kingsman, so I want to see what he would do with someone like Superman, you know. Uh, but yeah, I I don't know who else, you know. I don't know, and no other directors are really popping it, to mind. It's an uphill battle because I feel like right now there's a there's a general apathy. And because they've went through the failure of the Snyderverse, and, it, you know, it, like, ten years ago, there was a thirst. There was a thirst for a DC universe. Mm-hmm. I think right now, comic book universes, there is an anti-thirst. There is a a desire for something different. So I think whatever does happen, like, it's, it's, it's going to have to actually win people over with quality rather than yeah. just existing. Because I think if you go back and watch Marvel Phase 1, it's not that good. Like it, it's you know it hey, felt weird at the time because it was doing it was giving attention we, to characters that wouldn't have had attention yeah. before, and because of that, you sort of felt some sort of sense of respect for it. But it wasn't. It's not actually that good. Like like I tried to go back and watch Thor a couple of years ago, the first mm-hmm. one, and like I can like I was bored. I was bored to tears. It's, I'm the wrong person to ask because I I do like that movie, but uh, it's like Thor. So um, I think it's a fun fish out of water. But I get what you're saying because. They they are different. They feel different. They feel of a time, and we were just happy to have good ones, right? Um, so you know, competently made superhero movies, because up to that point, I can't even tell you what the most competently made one was. If it was Spider Man, you know, um, so, but yeah, we'll see where it goes. I mean, I get more excited over certain properties than just all of Marvel, and I still love to take shots at Eternals. You know, because that feels like it has had zero impact on on the grand scheme of things. Um, yeah, and I picked on Thor there for the record because at mm-hmm. the time I thought Thor was the best Phase One movie before the Avengers, mm-hmm. uh, and now I think it's boring to watch. <laughs> like I, I can't, <laughs> I can't get through it. Uh, first yeah. Captain America was always bad. Don't at me. Nah, nah, no, that's where we fight. Nah, it's always so, bad. All, yeah. Always bad. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, I don't have much more to say. I, honestly, the movie yeah. stuff—it's—it's it's so weird because I'm still like I'm still excited for the comics, but the, mm-hmm. I think it's just something to do with like when the comics are doing well, it's because they're doing well at being comics, and mm-hmm. the movies are weird because they're adaptations of the comic material, and it's really depressing when you get an Aquaman movie and it's su- it's sucked dry of any of the actual character that's in the comic books and any of the atmosphere that's in the comic books and instead you just get a cool bro movie with a surfer dude uh who's acting like himself i don't know i just mm-hmm. like it's it's disheartening I, it's, yeah you know it's disheartening that's all i'm saying anyway mm-hmm. uh let's talk about comics uh so starting off with dark crisis big bang issue one mark wade writing with dan jurgens on the r mm-hmm. uh i knew very little about this going into it it was just kind of another Dark Crisis one shot that kind of appeared. Uh, yeah, I remember this one from Solicits because it was going to say they were talking about how they're going to explain the the new worlds that we've been getting. You know, the 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 uh, Tom Taylor, um, Dark Knights of Steel. You know, drastically DC Mac. They were going to explain, not explain, but showcase where they fit in into the multiverse, and that was all. That, and it was going to be written by Mark Wade. So. Um, I will say it's a little bit disappointing just because I expect more out of Mark Wade, And this just kind of felt like a whistle stop tour of the multiverse. Um, and the story, I just, when I have Mark Wade white writing a flash character, I don't know. I just have higher expectations and not that this was bad, but it was just, it was kind of there for me. Um, and, and yeah, I just, I thought it should have been a little bit better. Yeah. The, the, the issue is Barry taking Wallace around the multiverse looking for the Anti-Monitor, which mm-hmm. I'm not really sure why. This kind of felt out of nowhere to me. Like, So I felt like they, what they were trying to say, right, is you remember in that last tie-in that we read with Robin and his team that introduced us to Red Canary? They went to the dead JL Apes world, and they kind of hinted that something happened that wasn't the darkness. 
Um, this is what I'm feeling that it was. It was the anti-monitor. And the anti-monitor is just taking advantage of all the chaos that's going on and is and is coming through and, and doing his anti-monitor shtick. Uh, I just wish that was more clear in the main book, right? Because the main book is just the darkness and Pariah and, you know, them fighting that. That's, so that's, just, have... that's just fairly out of nowhere for me. Yeah. But, um, I mean, I thought the book was well enough written. Like, I think Mark Wade's got the voices of the characters down, and mm -hmm. he clearly loves the DC multiverse because all these references as, as they're going through, um, like, you know, you see uh, Dark Knights of Steel Universe, you see DC versus mm -hmm. Vampires, Jurassic League. Like, you see all these modern ones, mm -hmm. but you also see lots of, like, obscure references. You see, obviously, you know, Earth 2, uh, Earth 3 with the Crime Syndicate, and so on and so on. In fact, mm -hmm. There's so many that the back of the book has a has a list of where all the yeah. Earths are and where they come from, which is quite handy. What's weird about it, though, and what made it feel a little bit less like a story and more like just like a sort of, you know... It's, like, like, it's a tour of the multiverse, yeah. right? Like, but it, it, like, as I was, you know, there's a few pages early on where as I'm reading it and I'm like, this is just like three pages in a row of showing me different Earths. Mm -hmm. there's, there's very little actually happening in terms yeah. of story here. And... A bit more starts happening when, like, they actually get to the Antimart and they start fighting them and they start mm -hmm. going through different Earths with the fight and, you know, you, you see, like, again, yeah. more. But it is ultimately just a lot of, like, cameos of different Earths. Uh, mm -hmm. And then eventually a bunch of heroes from different Earths uh, team up to help Barry yeah, and Wallace. The, the backup. You know, right? fight the, yeah. uh, fight um, the Antimart. And, and that's what I mean with Wade is that, like, I know Wade loves all this stuff, right? Wade, Wade is kind of one of us. In that, and that he loves the DC universe and everything that these characters stand for. So I just expected more than just like cameos and stuff. I expected him to weave a story with Barry interacting with some of these characters and giving us like, you know, a little bit more than just like, hey, look at the Dark Knights of Steel Earth and hey, look at the, the DC versus Vampires Earth. And, you know, so that's all. But again, the Jurgens art's fine too, because Jurgens is a pretty solid, you know artists still so you know these characters all look like they do in, in their other earths so I think it wasn't bad it was just again it was just kind of there for me um however i did like the index a lot in the back because you start getting into some of these more like lesser known ones and i don't remember the number but the description is oh it's the nothing really is different except everyone's a werewolf and i just thought that explanation was hilarious yeah, I, I think this just feels like a a tie-in. They wanted another one shot, and Mark Wade says it, said, "Yeah, sure, I'll have fun just listing mm -hmm. a bunch of arts and referencing a bunch of obscure shit." And that's kind of all it is, though. Uh, and you know, at the end, it just kind of says, "Yeah, Dark Crisis will finish in issue seven. And I feel like this didn't really add anything to Dark Crisis in any yeah. way, shape, or form. Um, I mean, it was nice that Barry and Wallace got to bond a little bit, I guess, because, you know... Barry... We haven't really seen much of that, right? No. Because it's been Wallace and Wally a lot, or Ace is... is I mean, you got, you got obviously, I'm sure, a lot of it in the New 52, but I wasn't reading that, so... <laughs> yeah, 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 but I'm talking about... We're, let, let's go for Rebirth on. But, but yeah, I know they get to bond and they get to hang out and, you know... Um, but yeah, I almost kind of like the, the last one, and I don't know I wasn't that big on. The one from last week that, you know, the... Where they went around the the last battle, you know, because those felt a little bit more focused, um, and they had more story to them. But again, again, I don't. I feel like I'm being too negative, but it was. I'm not upset that I read it. Like it's still a fine read, but you know, um, yeah, I had nothing else to add. It's just it's just another example of like once again we're reiterating part of crisis and. You know, how, how many times can we have characters reference Crisis, say what happened in Crisis, mm -hmm. and then just sort of go on a tour of the multiverse or a tour of DC history? Mm -hmm. It tends to be a tour of DC history more often than the multiverse, but yeah. uh, same kind of vibe, which is just like, here's us reiterating all this stuff again without really actually telling much of a story. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, because at the end of this, it's just basically Barry like, Yes, I you know did the impossible. I was willing to give my life yeah. again, but I didn't have to because the other heroes yeah. were there to help me. Because we're a team, because we're Justice League, and that's what superheroes are. Blah blah blah. Yeah, it's like yes, we've we've had this many a time yeah. at this point. Uh, it's not really. I also like that he he does this thing where he runs around the Earth a bunch of times, 
so he can deliver a super massive punch to the anti monitor. Uh, I like that. that Which was, that was the visual fun. of that panel made me think of Superman the movie. Yeah. And then they actually had Christopher Reeve Superman pop up. Uh, yeah. So pretty cool. You know, I don't think that was yeah. unintentional. That was another thing we got clarity on is that the um, the the Batman sixty six universe with uh, Wonder Woman, right? The the Wonder Woman TV universe that's its own universe too. They clarify. And then the Superman um, 70, what was it, Superman? 78. 78 and the Batman 89 are the same universe. Yeah, now. they're, they're so, 789. Yep. So I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, I like the way that they worked that out. Um, and uh, yeah, it was, but yeah, the, the world punch thing I thought was pretty funny because the way that Barry, you know, explains it and he's like, yeah, the more speed you get, the more mass you get and I'm just going to keep running until I'm at my limit. Then I'm going to give him a good old one-two. Uh, so, yeah. Honestly, it's another very, very skippable uh, tie-in one-shot to Dark Crisis. Yeah. And the only thing that I would say people might like about it is the index at the back. But honestly, you could probably just go to DC Wiki and get a similar list. Uh, uh, someone posted it early on Tuesday on Reddit. So, so there you go. Yeah, someone yeah. screenshotted it. You can already see it if you want. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Great. So that's pretty much it. So what are you giving that Dark Crisis Big Bang issue one? I'm I'm gonna give this a six point five. Yeah, I'll just give it a straight six. Uh yeah. that's fine. I I like Mark Wade's voice for the characters. There just wasn't really much mm. of a story in it. Yeah. Uh so there you go. Uh Superman Son of Kalel issue eighteen, Tom Taylor Rain, Lucy and Tormy, and uh Ruri Coleman on the art. So yeah, this uh I completely forgot what was going to be the last issue of this. Yeah. Um. And honestly, didn't even realize it was until I checked. Uh, when I was getting the info together for the the names and stuff. Yeah, because so, now it's just it's reverting reverting back to Superman, right? From Superman, Son of Kal-El. But the, well, it depends if you count this as like. Right. Like, I, I would just say this is a different book, and then we're getting Superman back. Back. Okay. If that makes sense. I mean, if anything, yeah. I'd, I'd say this is this is turning into the miniseries that we're getting. Yeah, as a direct true. follow up to this. That, that's a better perspective. Yeah. Uh. So yeah, Superman and, and John are are rebuilding the Kent uh, house with uh, the Justice League, which I feel like yeah. I've seen before, like numerous times at this point. Yeah, but I love that it just how wholesome it feels, and then you got like you know, is it Hal helping stabilize the beams, and you know, the flashes helping out, or just. I just like the sense of community here. Hmm. So, going from there, uh, they're looking into this Red Sin stuff mm -hmm. and who this guy is, uh, this Lewis, and these parents work for LexCore, and, uh, you know, he basically continued their work, perfected it, and is like a, a zealot. He hates John. He thinks that John and Clark are aliens and that they're a yep. threat to the world, and he believes he's helping. So he actually, like, uh, attacks Jimmy to get his Superman watch so that he yep. can call Superman somewhere so he can attack John, which sure enough is what the main bit of the issue is, is mm -hmm. Clark flies off to deal with that, John tries to deal with the bomb that's at uh, Daily Planet, which isn't a real bomb. Uh, it's nope. established later on that the he, diversion. he has no int interest in actually... Well, no, the, the watch is the diversion. I thought Jimmy still had... I thought, yeah, 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 but it, that was... The, the diversion wasn't that to keep them busy, right? To keep them separated. I mean, it's deceptive. That's how I read it. No, it is, but it's like yeah. the diversion is to get rid of Superman, so that's the watch. Like, right. the, the main thing is still where John is. Like, that's, that's the, the trap, the bait. <laughs> right, but it's, it's John. Uh, um, Clark goes to look for Jimmy, right? Which and is the diversion. The, <laughs> right, but he still had the watch. That's how he got them into the forest there at the end. So that the diversion was the uh, how I took it is that Red Sin was going to kill Superman. Wait, what are you talking about? He asked how he got him into the forest. That's at the end, right? Unless I missed something. What are you talking about? <laughs> let me let me pull it up. So right, so what I remember reading was that the, he goes and attacks Jimmy. He gets a signal watch, right? And then there's a bomb called in at the Daily Planet. John stays there. Superman goes to find Jimmy. And then that's where John realizes that this is taking too long. Dad should have got to him quicker. So that's where he goes to look for his dad. 
Yes. Right? Right. So that's what I said. The bomb is the diversion to split them up. No, right? it's not. The watch is the diversion to split them up. They're mm. both going to the bomb in the first place. The bomb is the bait. <laughs> mm. uh, no, because part of the plan is... The, the... <laughs> no, the, the watch is the bait. Because that's what draws them into Red Sin. The watch is not what draws them into Red Sin. The, wa- the yes, watch is yes, what draws is. Superman away. <laughs> I'm looking, I'm looking. It doesn't lure him to a forest. He just he <laughs> Jesus Christ. says the watch is stopped, and then that's when he falls through, and that's where Red Sin is. So you, I assume that Red Sin had the signal watch because that's why it was going <laughs> off for forty five seconds. This is such a stupid debate. It doesn't yeah, matter. Yeah. The, the 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 point <laughs> the point is the. Although I just want to point out that Rojas is Spanish for red. So Luis Rojas is is Luis Ray. Oh Jesus Christ! Yeah. E- either way, um, I got it. Go. He finds a bomb, and that's yeah. So, anyways, um, I thought <laughs> I thought toward these art here, um, like when when John falls into the forest, and just the way that the light hits, and the, like the blues and the greens, um, everything has like the sinister feel to it. And I think that it looks really nice. And then the glow of the red around uh, Superman and, and Red Sin, um, I thought looked pretty, pretty cool. That That's really where the art, um, I feel, is working its best here. So. What also, actually... Jimmy, don't, also, Jimmy, don't fall for free pizza, my guy. Like, you, you live in a world where people are actively, you know, trying, like, they know you're Superman's best friend. So. Good. Yeah. Um, what they don't get into is what actually happened to Superman mm-hmm. when he went off to like find the watch, like, right. which is why, which is why, which is why I'm not entirely sure uh, why you think the watch is in the forest luring John there. I I'm assuming that he still went to where the watch is, which is with Jimmy, where he's passed out on the floor. Right. So. Hold on. So I was under the impression that he took. So how did we're so all, Superman? Matt, we're all aware what you were under the impression. Yeah. Of. You've said so, it. <laughs> so then, how did? So so how did Rojas find Superman then? Hold on. Be specific. So when 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 Which Superman? <laughs> okay. When John falls into the forest, he comes up and says, "Lewis, stop." And that's and is it Superman's there with him? Correct. Because he goes John, and he pulls away. So why, if Superman wasn't looking for the signal watch, how would Superman be there? No one said he wasn't looking for the signal watch. Of course he was looking for the signal watch. Right. So okay, so he's looking for the signal watch. How how does he just randomly come across Red Sin? Does he just fall like John did? Because I didn't take it as that. What do, what do you mean? Red Sin's with the signal watch. This is not confusing. <laughs> right. That... Right. So again, the signal watch is the bait, and the bomb is the diversion. No. <laughs> yes. The, the watch is the diversion, because it's the whole point is to separate them and lure Superman somewhere to try and help Jimmy. He's clearly... He, like... John just falls where he falls because he's tracking the watch afterwards and doesn't understand why it's not stopped yet. Right? right. He, he, like, he, the fact that he, he shouts stop uh, almost implies that he just happened to get there in time to interrupt what was going on. That Lewis probably wanted to actually just kill Superman before he went after John. Right, that's what I'm saying. So that's... Right. So he drew Superman to him with the signal watch. Yes. Right. That's what I'm saying, is that that's why Superman was there in that forest, was to draw him there. (laughs) He was going to kill him. John shows up, prevents that from happening. So again, the watch was the bait. That's what drew Superman to him. Because if the bomb was the bait, then that's where 
Red well, yeah, if you're, if you're talking about it from Superman's perspective, but, but this is John's yes. book. I'm talking about it from John's perspective. Right, but it's still, but Red Sin's plan still is to kill both of them. No, and, I, and, I know. Right. So, either way, <laughs> either way, Red Sin had the signal watch. Yes, no one was disputing that. No one was ever disputing that. That's what I that. thought you were saying that he didn't have it, and that's where I got very confused. No, of course he had it. In the, in the forest. <laughs> that's why he knocked out Jimmy. What the hell was he doing, yes. Jimmy? He didn't right. knock out Jimmy with, with gas gas pizza because he just wanted to say hello. Gas pizza, also known as Pizza Hut. Uh, <laughs> at least if you're me. Hooey. Anyways, let's just keep yeah. going because uh, John gets shot. Um, and... Uh, you know, got, got a little bit worried here. Um, and we got this really cool aspect, though, because <clears throat> finally John going into the future has paid off a little bit because we really haven't talked about his time with the Legion. Um, I, I mean, that's fine. Um, outside of him knowing that his dad was gone during the War World stuff, right? And he was worried about that. But we see that Brainy made him like a breaking case of emergency device. Which I do like that they <clears throat> that Tom Taylor hints at a little bit in the beginning with Clark, where he goes, you know, in case anything goes wrong, you know, break the glass. And I thought that was just like a saying between them, like don't be afraid to call in reinforcements, because we've had that discussion with John and Clark. Is John's very headstrong and thinks he can take this on all by himself. So that's what I thought he was like. This is going to be his, you know, moment to call in Nightwing and, and the crew, right? And Jay and and all of these other people that we've seen over the course of the book. Um, but instead, it's this belt that has, I guess, solar fire in it, right? Um, that Brainiac 5 made him in the future. And he breaks it, and it recharges him, and it's a really cool scene. Yeah, uh, the other detail here is that he gets shot multiple times whilst mm -hmm. he's weak. And that ties in later afterwards, mm -hmm. Superman says, are you wearing the vest? It turns out mm -hmm. Nightwing's advice at the start of the book, which we didn't get to hear, was that right. he should be wearing protection, even if, you know, you know, in theory, right. it's useless. But turns out it saved his life because otherwise he'd have been shot three times mm -hmm. in the chest. So, uh, so, th so basically he prepped for the idea that he might just be human at some point uh, right. whilst fighting this guy. So uh, they, they're able to freeze him. Um and the yep. end of the, the 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 book is um John trying to talk to him uh him tell him basically just being xenophobic and saying no yeah. you're not a person you're an alien you're a danger to everyone uh you know claims that Lois has been putting out you know pro alien propaganda because she's having sex with an alien you know stuff like that it's so uh, gross rhetoric like yeah. Tom Taylor's really good at writing these kinds of irredeemable characters, right? Like, just the slimier the better, coming out of Tom Taylor. So I remember characters like this popping up in his Wolverine run, too. Right? Just unrepentant jerks. So, And then the final scene is Lex, uh, via hologram, admittedly, but showing up mm -hmm. in his cell and basically saying, he's like, oh, I'm proud of you, son, and your parents were doing good work, and you're going to want to help me because I'm going to take down Superman and mm -hmm. you, you know, made a Superman bleed today. Uh, so it ends on this cliffhanger uh, for what they're doing next with him. And yeah, so mm -hmm. this leads into at least part of Action 1050 and mm -hmm. we'll see where it goes from there. Um, yeah, it just felt like the last issue of an arc to me rather than the last issue of a book. But mm -hmm. I guess that's because technically it's not really the end because the right. six-issue miniseries coming up really is the end of the it's book. coming. Yeah. Um, I do like that it, though, it kind of puts, like, uh, not a capstone, but, like, on... Like, John has learned from from the first issue. You know, there there has been a character arc here about, you know, him listening to others and not just taking everything on head-on. Um, so... Feels, feels a, like the character has grown. Uh, and we did get into a little bit when he's talking about, you know, not having the powers and what led to Brainiac making that device for him was being stuck in that volcano. Um, which I was kind of, you know, first when I started reading that, I was kind of like, oh, this again, okay. Um, but that's also been kind of a hallmark of this book too, is John, you know, learning to to process his feelings from, from that year with Jarrell. So, um. Felt like that put a nice capper on it. 
I mean, I, I like the little detail that he's just going to keep coming back and talking to Red Sun mm-hmm. and ho- the hope that he'll eventually break through to him. Obviously, he's yeah. not going to because Lex is already no. like talking to him and, you know, start, it, it's very... start, start on the nefarious plans. But yeah. I, I do like the idea that he's going to try anyway, or that's his intention. And, yeah. uh, you know, just... He's little... his father's son, after all. And just our little things like, uh, you know, Lois references that, like, his parents, like, were part of a group, you know, like a subreddit or whatever that hates Superman and mm-hmm. uh, hates both of them. It's like, yeah, don't read it, <laughs> like, to, to them. Because yeah. it'll just be hateful Sweet. stuff. <laughs> so yeah. it's just little um, details of that I appreciate in the issue. Yeah, and after he tries to talk to him, he goes back and meets Superman on, or meets Clark on the roof uh, of, of the Kent home, and they're just talking, and, you know, he's he tells his dad thanks for what he goes for raising me uh to hate right for not raising me to hate people i don't know and like he even though he has like this guy is just hates him for everything he is but john has a perspective where he's like he doesn't want to hurt anyone and clark's like yeah he shot you yesterday he's like yeah but you know what i mean he thinks he's protecting the world you know he was just coming after me so and that's where he decides that he's going to try to keep talking to him you know, like maybe I can find something in there. Um, and I think that's very admirable on John's part. And it goes with what we've seen throughout this series too, right? Like him trying to talk to people, not just go in. So, um, but yeah, no, Tom Taylor writing Superman has been been a lot of fun. Uh, it's been good. It's not been great. And I say that yeah. because... Comparing it to Taylor's other work at DC, mm-hmm. it's definitely on the lower end of the spectrum. Um, you know, it's no Nightwing. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, I don't even think it's as good as the Suicide Squad run. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, that's not a big deal. It's still, you know, no, even the lowest still of his, good. The lowest of his work at DC is still pretty strong. Yeah. Um, but it is on the lower end of the spectrum. Um, mm-hmm. So it's, uh, but that, 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 that's it though. That, there's no point in getting that reflective right now because it's not really the end. There's another six issues. It just happens to be on a different title. So uh, we'll see how that goes. Uh, art in the book is obviously uh, pretty much what it's been like yeah. uh, by and large, <clears throat> uh, which is, again, good, not great. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, there's the, so, some of the, the, the faces and things that just aren't necessarily to my taste. I don't really have anything to add to it because it's been the same same thing I've been yeah, seeing every issue for the last... You know, this, this one, though, is a little bit more... It felt a little... <laughs> kind of more rushed towards the end there like that scene i was just talking about with with clark and john on the roof one well, of the there is a over... second artist on this issue so yeah. maybe it was actually was under saying. the gun a little bit it, it felt like tore me but not really it was like someone trying to copy tore me so you know maybe the the secondary artist you know was just trying to blend it better but yeah some of the some of the faces on john and clark a little bit rough um but you know, it's still the wider shots tend to, to flow better, but yeah, yeah. So that'll uh, wrap that up pretty much. So, uh, what are you rating Superman? I'm gonna give this a seven point five. Yeah, uh, I agree with that. Seven point five seems about right mm-hmm. for me. Yeah. Uh, all right, cool. Uh, Batgirls issue thirteen, Becky Clunan and Michael Conrad writing with uh Jonathan Case on the art. So different art in this. So I'll talk about that mm-hmm. in a bit. Uh, but Matt caught up with Batgirls for this week. Yeah. Well, I, I went back and I read the annual. I went and picked that up, and then I read this one. Uh, because I'm I'm curious with this Freaky Friday deal. Okay, so you didn't go back and read the no. last arc. No, no, no. So just you probably just should, what I but... remember you talking about in the annual uh, the mutant that coin. Um, and you know, having the the sloppy. So what's interesting is that it's not just a two parter; it's just listed mm-hmm. as one because the arc is still going on. It's just that the, the yeah. body swap part is wrapped up right. by the end of the issue. But the actual yeah, story a, that it kicks off. If is still I going. hadn't been listening to you, I would have had to gone back. Right? Like if I just had heard about this, like oh, body swap with the back girls. Um, but like remember hearing you talk about the the guy that Steph's been talking to. Um. And like dealing with the with the serial killer there and all this other stuff, I was familiar enough where I wasn't lost, so you know that helped. But yeah, you it probably helped to go back uh, past the annual a little bit um, if you were to catch up. I mean, I'd recommend the last arc or two. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, basically issue seven or whatever it was onwards. Mm-hmm. 
Um, so yeah, uh, well, it ended last issue with, you know, Steph and Cass in each other's bodies mm-hmm. and each of them had been taken by their respective parents. So, yep. uh, we had Steph and Cass's body with Lady Shiva, uh, and Lady Shiva does clock that it's not quite her daughter yeah. fairly early on, you know, uh, and pulls out a knife and tries to fight. Uh, meanwhile, Cass is in Steph's body, which is tied up <laughs> and in the back of a car as Clue Master's taking her. Yep. Uh, somewhere, which if it ends up in like their old house or something like that. Yeah. Uh, we find out later on. Uh, so it's definitely a bit more Steph and Cassie's body focused because she's you know talking and not tied up mm-hmm. in the back seat of a car. Uh, there's a little bit of Babs and Bruce investigating stuff and yep. ultimately going to Zatanna for for some help with this this magical coin that did the body swap. Yeah. Which uh, there's a silly little excuse for why she's in an old outfit. Just you know, it's laundry yep. day apparently i feel it's because the artist wanted to draw classic zatanna so they they felt they threw that in there a little bit so that's, that's fine i like the the top hat and fishnets every once in a while for z that does feel like the thing um mm-hmm. honestly i wasn't super into the art here uh it is super like it, it is very cartoony but it feels very different to what the book has been the, up until the very this point. expressiveness cartoony yeah. Yeah, because going from the annual to this, back to back, you feel that change big time, yeah. where it's similar, and, but it's not nearly as crisp. And they are in the annuals, pretty much how it, what it's been for the last, you know, mm-hmm. five or six issues, I think. So, yeah. Yeah, and, and that, well, a little different from that first arc, which I do mm-hmm. wish that first arc stuck around. Yeah. And That's not, uh, Jorge Corona? Right? Yeah. 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 So, well, I, I wish Corona had stuck around. I, 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 I think it did a decent job, uh... Try like setting a style. St- yeah, just sort of sticking to some sort of overall style. But this feels far too clean. Like, there's a lot of flat yeah. colors in this where the one thing it didn't have before was flat colors. It was very, you know, there was a sort of a nice, pleasant, sketchy quality to it. There was like sort of a... Kind of a richness to the art. Yeah. You know, texture. So, yeah, texture's a good word. Uh, and it's just kind of gone here, which is a shame. Yeah. Uh, so, the, the, whole, the whole fight with Steph and Lady Shiva, though, is quite fun because... Uh, Steph's very different to Cass as a fighter and that she's very unpredictable because she's not like trained mm-hmm. like so so yeah. Cass is very like coordinated and like very like methodical in how she fights. Yeah. Steph is more like oh I'll just a brawler. I- I'll just dive this way randomly because you didn't see yeah. that coming. <laughs> yeah. Kind of thing. Uh and ultimately has a heart to heart with uh with Shiva. Lady Shiva uh saying that her daughter, you know, that's, that Cass is 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 perfect, you just don't see it. Um and something that back uh, Batgirl being Barbara and Batman have found out because uh, they've tracked down the 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 person behind this which we'll get into in a yep. second. Uh, they find out that the wish was only for them to spend a day in each other's shoes, so they're just going to revert back after twenty four hours. And yep. sure enough, uh, that happens. And it's a really fun play on things actually because it's like okay, so. Cass is now back in her own body, but she knows that Steph's in trouble and has been kidnapped right. by her father. So that's obviously where the plot's going uh, mm-hmm. next issue, which is cool. Uh, yep. So that was kind of nice. But you also get a little bit of time with Cass uh, with Lady Shiva, where you know Lady Shiva's like, ignore the mess. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> like your friend's very nice, but ignore the mess. Yeah. Also, her like looking down, Steph looking, or uh, Steph Cass looking down in- into the dress she's wearing too. I thought that was very funny. Um, like, so... That was probably the first thing that tipped, tipped Shiva off, was that she was yeah. willing to put on the dress. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was the first thing. I was like, wait a minute. Yep. What's going uh, on? Uh, so, yeah. Fun stuff. Um, yeah, so uh, there's an obscure character here that's revealed to be mm-hmm. the, the, the old broad who gave, gave them the, the coin in the first place. Mm-hmm. Uh, turns out to be... Where's the name? Madame Zodiac. Mm-hmm. Do you know this character? Yeah, so so I pulled her up. She's a old school, like, 60s, 70s magic person. Okay. That, okay. You know, that has, like, fortune-telling divination kind of powers. Um, so kind of kind of runs with the Madame Xanadu crowd, like that side of DC. Um, kind mm-hmm. of an in-between. Um, just like, hey, I was just having fun. Kind of a trickster. So... I wasn't that familiar with her, but I feel like I've read stories where she's popped up as like a side character, or like it had no impact on the plot. And I was like, oh, that's a weird design. 
I mean, I, I assumed it was a character from DC's mm-hmm. past. I didn't know. It just had that feeling yeah. to it. But I mean, I well, even it when it's in the annual, when it's the old lady with the cat, the whole situation feels off, mm. right? And then she tips uh, Steph with the coin. And you're just like, huh, weird. That's supposed to be somebody. Um, and I was thinking at that time it was going to be like, you know, Clarion because of the cat or someone, mm. someone in the magic variety, you know, that has a familiar of a cat. So, but was not expecting Lady Zodiac, but I don't think anyone else was either. So. Yeah, it's also a fun little bit at the end where uh, Steph wakes up in her own body and she's like, wait, dad, what mm-hmm. was happening? <laughs> what, what was going on when I wasn't yeah. here? Uh, and obviously that little tease at the end where he's like, uh, no one knows where you are, but he's wrong because right, cause his cast does. Yes. So also, man, why is Clue Master giving me off like Unabomber vibes? Like that's never been his thing, right? Like, mm. like yeah, Clue Master has some issues, but he's mainly just like a, a petty crook kind of dude that you know. Well, he did, clues. as he says to her when she's tied mm-hmm. up. Uh, technically it's Cassie says this too yeah. but uh, you know he, he technically died for three days he was clinically yeah. dead for three days uh, yeah. and you see like, the mark around his neck so I wonder if yeah. uh, yeah, that's messed him up a bit more he's, he's a bit more it could, extremist it could be, but yeah. driving out to a cabin in the middle of the woods you know just like yeah it's all it's all weird so a nice take on Clue Master makes him stand out a little bit right like I mean, it was fun to have both Shiva and Clue Masters pop up at the same time because mm-hmm. it was kind of a nice, like, you know, dichotomy between the two, mm-hmm. the two characters. Uh, and you know, you really get this feeling that Steph and Cass are the main characters, and Babs is this, like, so, you know, the the elder, the support yeah. role character, which is uh, which is neat. I mean, I suppose the real test is: is are you wanting to read the next issue? Are you in? Uh yeah, I gotta see where this goes now. So I'm in until this arc's over, at least, um, just to see where. Where the story goes, so you got to see what what's up with Clue Master and what, because even in the solicits they're hinting about who hired Clue Master. Mm. So this is there's part of something bigger going on, uh, and also I, I do enjoy the dialogue back and forth between everybody, like the the Bruce and Bab stuff in particular. Yeah, I thought was what was nice here, because it felt like nice and familiar between them. And you didn't um, even get any Steph and Cast dialogue this issue. No, Mm-mm. you got some in the last issue. You might refer yeah, to Daniel, but uh. yeah. So, um, but the back and forth there, and then even even Steph as Cass just talking back to to Shiva was really well done too. So yeah, I'll probably hang on until this arc's over, and then we'll see where we are. But I mean, this was a dead week anyway, so it just gave me you know two extra things to read. So it's not too bad. Yeah. Um. And the third person narration wasn't too egregious this issue. No. Uh, if I thought at the start it was that just the editor's note basically saying, "Hey, yeah. that started in the annual," so. <laughs> yep. if you didn't read it they've swapped bodies you need to know mm-hmm. that that's a very important detail to know mm-hmm. uh, like I say I wasn't super into the art it felt like it was really flat compared to normal and yeah. uh, they keep the colour scheme of the art uh, from before but uh, it's not enough to make it feel the same I don't think mm-hmm. so um, you know and for some reason Bruce looks like really I was going to say he looks really young but I don't know if he even looks young he just looks he looks kind of skinny and he doesn't look like a guy that's built that fights no. criminals at night. He looks uh Definitely not. It looks like a dude who's uh needing to eat a few extra pounds of meat or something. Yeah. <laughs> he needs to get his, his carbs up or his carbs, his calories up. Yeah. But uh yeah, okay. Well there you go. No, fun issue. It was a fun issue though, uh, writing wise. I, I just I thought the art yeah. was a step down. Uh what are you rating back girls, Matt? Uh, I'm gonna give this a solid seven. Yeah, I'd agree with the seven. It would probably be a bit higher if, if the art was uh consistent yeah. with the last uh, few issues but hey uh, all right wildcats issue two matthew rosenberg with steven segovia on our so we get you know a lot of new characters to, to us yes. obviously they're not new new uh, no. in general but so i had to remember where we left off at and it was um grifter and zealot had gone off to rescue fairchild right um and and that's where we we pick right back up. Um, and they were trying here. to get a scientist, but uh, yeah, Grifter shot him. So right. Uh, um, and the the cliff higher was them landing uh, next to the court owls, which yes. is where we pick off. Um, and uh, there's action. There's chaos. They have no idea who the court owls are. 
Uh, he keeps calling him a cult, which I like. <laughs> uh, I will say the high point of this is Rosenberg's writing, and not just like the way that uh, it's set up as a story. The dialogue and the descriptions and everything, I feel like it's kind of like what people try to sell me Deadpool as, where like his grifter is so just like off the cuff, you know, making these these random um, observations. That these these all really land though, so it is a joy to read, even if I don't know what's really going on. Um, yeah, you know, there's stuff where he's like he's telling the nurse uh, in the hospital, okay. uh, uh, you know, that he's he's basically describing the plot of uh, DC versus vampires, and yeah. she's not buying it. But as she's walking out, uh, she says, "Thanks for saving our universe, Batman." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, all right, so he's been telling stories, and then there's another bit later yeah. where. Uh, was it Deathblow? I think the name is. Uh, yeah. Like he's he, he's got a new body and it's a it's a female body and his yeah. inner monologue says, "Oh, Deathblow is kind of hot now. I'm going to have to try and make sure he doesn't get killed." And then it was just a second narration box saying, yeah. "I swear those two were separate thoughts." <laughs> those are those are two separate thoughts. I promise. Yeah. yeah. So like Rosenberg's like stuff for Grifter is very good, and even like even when we start getting into the more businessy side of things, it's just written in such a way where. The person talking is, you know, has so much like disdain for the people they're talking to. It really. Oh you yeah, know... their their boss. Uh, what Marlo? Marlo? Marlo. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah it, but he's like answering to other people. They're having this meeting yep. where Mrs. Freeze is there, and uh, yep. things aren't going as planned. And part of it's because they don't have this new scientist. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, there's definitely a lot going on though, because he, he goes to uh, Voodoo to like check out where, oh. where this fight took place at the start you know this, this fight mm -hmm. where the court elves were there and green arrow was there it takes voodoo to like go and like look at the crime scene and try and see if they can figure anything out uh mm -hmm. whilst uh marlo someone tries to kill him <laughs> and the others have to step in uh and uh zella ends up like having this action scene where she fights a bunch of guys yeah. out in the road in a red dress and you know, it, like Segovia's art is pretty solid. I would say. Mm -hmm. Um, I kind of, I kind of like his ex the expressions on the the characters' faces and the general inkiness to the uh, mm -hmm. the the line work. Uh, I quite like that. Um, yeah. But then the news pops up and basically paints them as criminals, and this is where Marlowe makes the choice that we're going to have to go public, and he reveals at the end of the issue uh, the seven soldiers of victory in a press conference. Which is not the, the Wildcats team. No. Uh, of course I noticed. So I, I was very confused by this last page. I'm not sure what's going on. But... Yeah, so I recognize Maul, who's the big Hulk looking blue and or blue, purple and green dude. Sure. Um I remember he was in Wildcats. And then we we got Grifter in the front looking like a, a, a Deathstroke Deadpool ripoff. And then it looks like Zealots there also, because I can tell by the markings on the face, but I don't know who anybody else is on this page. And then to call them the Seven Soldiers of Victory on top of it, um, I got very confused, but in a good way. To where I'm like, what is going on? And the guy that tried to kill Marlo, right? The way that Marlo goes on about it, he's like, yeah, I, I did too much, and now they're trying to take me out. And from what I kind of know about Wildcats from back in the beginning, because I did a little research when reading the Grifter book, is that... Everything about the Wildcats comes down to a war between aliens and and another group, right? You have Halo and, and the Wildcats and the Daemonites. Um, so who knows who Marlo is working for, but I feel like there's a higher up that was trying to make him pay for his failure here. And now this is his, his big gamble. So we'll see how many of these characters make it out. Um, but I, I definitely feel like uh, Grifter and Zealot are, are still the stars. Here. It feels like there's a couple of red shirts for sure. Uh, Big time to, to to take some hits here. Um, yeah, I, I mean, honestly, it's surprisingly easy to read, uh, mm -hmm. even though I don't really have much atta attachment to any of this property <laughs> or characters, or mm -hmm. uh, really fully understand what's going on exactly. But uh, you know, I, I didn't have a bad time. Like no, and also seeing these characters inter interact with the greater DCU, right? So, like, on this board at Halo, you you have Professor Ivo, mm -hmm. right, who created Amazo, and he talks about his his work with Dr. Morrow, who's, you know, the creator of the Metal Men. Um, 
just to see them interacting with with these wildstorm characters. Oh is yeah, kind of one, cool. one of them accuses them of having sex with robots. That's right. <laughs> yeah, and he doesn't deny. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, what's the point of making robots if you can't have sex yeah. with them? What's, so, what's the point of that? You know, it doesn't feel like they're also being wedged in because they still feel like they're on the periphery. You know, they keep talking about the archer as a green arrow. You know how you know he doesn't have superpowers. He's like, well, he has to. He rolls around with the Justice League. There's got to be something about him. You know. So again, it just feels like it's on the periphery, but it is an enjoyable read. And I say that like I don't say begrudgingly, but you know, this is a book that I was like, nah, oh, cats. But after the you know um, the, the Grifter story in uh, what's that Gotham yeah. whatever. Um, Urban I Legends. Call it, there you go. Urban Legends. I always want to call it Gotham Underground for whatever reason. But yeah, in Urban Legends, I was like, okay. It seems like Rosenberg really likes these characters. And with that love, it, hopefully it comes through. And I think that it has. So No, I think it mostly has to. It's it's enjoyable enough to read. And I think the other benefit it has going for it, as long as it stays enjoyable to read, is that it's also a little different from most other DC books because mm-hmm. it's this Yeah. You know, it's like yeah, they're a team of people who have abilities kind of, but they're you know, they're 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 more like a. I, I guess the closest thing is to concept wise is kind of Suicide Squaddy, uh, but mm-hmm. you know, it's it's got its own kind of voice, and yeah. uh, I've enjoyed the two issues I've read so far. So mm-hmm. you know, I'll be back for okay. issue three. Yeah, oh for sure. As long as Rosenberg keeps writing it, I'll keep picking it up. Um, just because he brings that he brings that little spin to it. Also, the the um. The guy that saves Marlo at the party, that's the android guy, right? That they were talking about, they were working on in the beginning. I think so. In the yeah. first in the first issue. I uh, feel like he's going to have a bigger role going forward because I felt how prime he was. So um, it feels like it's definitely a team coming together still. But yeah, I got stumped by the seven soldiers. I was like, when they're getting ready for the reveal, I'm getting ready to see the, you know, the wildcats I remember from posters in the 90s. And I was like, outside the the big green and purple dude, I don't know much who these other guys are. So that, I mean, I was, that was a nice curveball. But I think it's interesting as a, a concept going forward that they're going public, quote unquote, but they're yeah. hiding who they really are because, for yeah. whatever reason. Uh, whether that's because they think it's a security risk to actually let people know who they are, or if it's mm-hmm. because they've done enough bad things that they just can't let them know that they're the Wildcats because Grifter... And Zilla are too wanted for various crimes that they, just, yep. they, they can't. I, I don't know. Maybe it's a public perception thing, or maybe the seven soldiers are picked intentionally to lure out someone. I, I don't know. But there's, yeah. there's a lot of plays. So, yeah. Uh, what are you giving Wildcats issue two? I'm going to give this an eight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I guess I'll agree with that. It's weird that this is going to rank quite high in my top five. Yeah, given these numbers, but yeah. But okay. it was just, it was it was just a solid fun read too. So yeah. like, you know. All right, there you go. All right, main event of the week uh, by far, I think, is Danger Street issue one. Tom King rating Jorge Fornes on the art. Mm-hmm. So we got a bit of a dream team back together again here, and I had no idea what the concept of this book really was. Like I, I saw I, that there was a, a random grouping of like you know, C-list characters involved, uh-huh. but that was it. Like, that's all I knew. Mm-hmm. So, there's a bookend here, which is, it's the Doctor Fate helmet that's telling the story, right? Mm-hmm. Could speculate about that later, but, <laughs> once we get into the story, we ha- we're introduced to, like, sort of three concurrent stories that are going on that are all going to be connected. Mm-hmm. We have a group of kids uh, who go through Danger Street, the titular Danger Street, who yeah. are they're known as the dingbats that's what they keep getting called yeah uh, uh throughout the book yeah so they're those the dingbats and they're just these four youngish kids who are driving was an rv rv they've got mm-hmm. uh and someone calls the cops on them and that introduces to another main character that we're following uh yeah. who they call lady cop uh her name is like eliza or something like that does yeah does not want to be called Lady Cop. Please. No, there's not very disrespectful. There's not like that at all. Yep. But she comes out and she's like, hey, like you can't be driving this on a road. I mean, none of you are old enough to even have a license. And mm-hmm. I think one says, though, well, technically he's had the test, but he keeps failing. <laughs> um, yep. But 
it's like, look, I'll forget the fact that I'm supposed to give you a $200 uh, ticket for driving without a license. Because uh, you need a license to be on the road. doesn't matter what type of vehicle it is. But mm-hmm. I'll, I'll take you to the desert where you, where you wanted to go and do off-road stuff and it's safe. And I'll go come and pick you up later and like escort you with the police car. Look, look at that. I'm, I'm, you know. I'm a, I'm a cool, I'm not a regular cop. I'm a cool cop. Yeah, she's nice to them. She's nice. Yeah. She, she's well, because she knows that they're not actually causing trouble, right? Like they're, they were trying to keep their heads down and do what was right, and that's what caused them, you know, issues. And better off that they're out riding the ATV in the desert than on the street. So let's just do. Which I didn't realize Danger Street was an actual street somewhere in D.C. So seeing that when it opened up, I thought was pretty funny. You mean California? Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. But like when I hear Danger Street is the title, I like. It had no significance. So the fact that that was the first thing that we see, right? That this clearly has ties to some of these other characters from back in the 70s. Um, had no idea that was a concept. Yeah. I mean, this is California, the window in the, in the book. Yeah, when I said DC, I meant the DC universe. Like, oh, not, okay, not, okay, not, okay. Not, I, not the... I just missed her, the, Okay, that right. <laughs> yeah. Not, not the, the capital of the country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, no, yeah, just that's just, uh, like I'm a little bit tired, all right. <laughs> you're fine, you're fine. <laughs> anyway, uh, so that sets up that, that side of the story. Uh, mm-hmm. you've got them, uh, you've got the Jack Ryder stuff where he is the creeper, of course, and he's taking out criminals in his spare time. Mm-hmm. But the main crux of his story is that he's like hopefully getting a new uh show on there. He's, he's meeting with some execs mm-hmm. to audition for a new news show where he can, you know, be himself and so on, and that leads to kind of a reveal about who the, the money people are behind this new TV network that he's interviewing for. And then we have um, a Starman, uh, Metamorpho, it's, it's... and Warlord, uh-huh. uh, who are meeting at a diner, and it turns out that Starman, no, sorry, sorry, no, it's not Starman, sorry, Metamorpho has stolen the Doctor Fate helmet, <laughs> mm-hmm. and they're going to use it to summon Darkseid to try and prove to the Justice League that they belong on the Justice League. Look, <laughs> I'm not saying it's a bad idea, <laughs> but it's not a good idea. Um, these three Yahoos, like the just like Darkseid is a is a Justice League level dude. Like, so them having this idea, I was like, oh, this is gonna be great. Cause how are they gonna mess this up? Um so just hearing that was their plan, I was like, oh, no, 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 no. So, uh, yeah. But also it fits in with Metamorpho, right? From what we we know about him, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, also, I do like that when he floats into the bar or the diner and he's like, I got it. And they're like, well, bring it here. He's like, I'm gas. I can't hold things. I thought that was very funny. Yeah, um, no. And there is one page in the middle uh, that teases that Manhunter's been sent after... A group of kids, which at the time in the issue, the only group of kids that we've met are the dingbats. You're like, why would they be hunting them? Uh, Obviously, there's another group of kids by the end that are more likely the targets. Uh, But yeah, so this all builds up to this tragedy because we, we, you know, we have like the kids out in the desert with the ATV. We have the the trio of characters in the car going out to somewhere in the desert because they think they'll be alone. And the big stuff that goes down is that it's actually Atlas that pops out angry and like starts fighting them. Mm-hmm. And the star man here gets spooked. And one of the kids from the dingbats who got off because he was sick and was on his own, uh, asked the question and he ends up turning around and instinctively just firing a blast at him and mm-hmm. seemingly kills the kid. So, and I wasn't surprised that it went to, to like a sort of shocking dark, like ending before before we got to the end yeah. of the book because it just felt like it was building up to something it was like everything here's too light and cheery like there's, there's a weight to it don't get me wrong there was a weight to it because it's, it's a tom king book and everything feels right. like it was a a heavy tone but these kids seem too happy it feels too light-hearted tragedy is going to strike and sure enough like you know they have to call the lady cop and be like oh god like you know he's dead come, come and help please uh so and I'm sure the fact that Atlas was yelling the sky is falling is also yep. relevant to whatever's going on. Um, but the big thing with Jack Ryder is that after he does this interview where he's complaining about crime and complaining about how crime's like a tax on everyone uh-huh. and all that stuff, he ends up going to meet the people who are setting up this new TV network that he's going to potentially be on. 
and it ends up being a group of kids who are all wearing green, which apparently uh, the green they're ref- team they're referred to as the green team. Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, also, uh, the the teen billionaires. They're a. I remember. I think it was Gail Simone did a one of those DCU books on the green team. Oh right. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, and I, that's the first time I'm hearing about it. All of these characters, not to sidetrack, but these all all these characters come from the '70s. And a lot of them have ties to Jack Kirby. And mm. so what what we know about Tom uh, King and and Jack Kirby, this is going to build, I feel like, to a, a big, big, big thing. Bigger than I think we thought, like, not like crisis level, but I feel like this, this story is going to be going places with these kind of sea level characters. It's a, it's a really interesting read because I think it's really compelling mm-hmm. on its own, even if you don't know who mm-hmm. any of these characters are. And I don't yeah. know who some of them are. Like, obviously, mm-hmm. I know Metamorpho. I know Jack Ryder, the Creeper, to an extent. Yeah. Um, you know, but I'm Mikhail, really, Starman, I'm familiar with. I'm not really familiar with this Starman, but I know Star, yeah. I know what Starman is. Um, right. I, I'm not super familiar with the green team, though. Mm-hmm. So, like, there's, there's parts of this where I'm like, okay, I get, like, some of this is what's going on. But I think... This group of kids and the lady cop, like, I think it's really wise to start with them because it's like they're new for everyone. These are new characters, no matter who you are, and you get drawn into the story because she's nice to them, even though they're being kind of goofy kids and doing something they're not supposed to be doing. And you're like, okay, you're drawn in, you care a little bit about some characters in the book before we start hitting with the DC, like, known characters. And, Mm -hmm. you know, they're presenting, and I think one of the things that Tom King's done so well with a lot of these books is that he's taken these, like, C-list characters. And just giving them like extra layers of personality, where the just the the, the humor of like, the the conversation between Warlord Metamorpho and Starman is just you know mm-hmm. it, it's amusing, it's witty, it's funny, and you know Warlord's just like annoyed to be there because the other two are are you know Starman's quite nervous, Warlord's uh, Metamorpho's just cracking jokes and mm-hmm. uh, being kind of cheesy because that's what he's like. Like it, it, it was a good bit of fun. Um, so, sure. I mean, I don't know how the Jack Ryder stuff factors into it quite yet, but like, no, but it definitely feels like the Green Team want to use him for his his communication, right? So, yeah, he, you know, the rant he goes on definitely hits a, a certain side that we've seen, you know, at least in Rorschach. Right, that Tom King hit up. And oh yeah, but I'm, like... I'm thinking in the context of this book, like how it ties into. Mm-hmm. I mean, thematically, I guess we're you know another main character is a cop, so mm-hmm. the idea of him talking about a crime tax being trying to prevent yeah. crime and things like that that would tie to her a little bit. Right. But I'm assuming that the creeper stuff, the Jack Ryder stuff, um, and the Green Team, and Manhunter mm-hmm. coming after the Green Team, presumably, yep. is going to somehow tie into what else is going on with the skies falling and. You know yep. what the trio of characters have do- accidentally done to this kid. Yep. You know, I, like all of this seems like it's. Well, yeah, and and the whole idea too of that that it's the helm of fate telling the story, but it's telling it like it's a fantasy. Mm. And these are all very, you know, I mean, Warlord notwithstanding, these are not fantasy characters. These are all kind of gritty. You know, um, I don't want to say pulp because they're not pulp, but. It, it's that like seventies ness of a Mike Lady Cop and the Dingbats and Creeper. Like there's just a this different like weird edge to them all. And so setting that over, you know, being telling that story through um through fantasy like type face and Yeah, because um, like, Face Helmet keeps uh, referring yeah. to like the cop lady as the princess. It keeps right. referring to the, uh, the three the, princes. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it keeps the keeps creeper using... as an ogre and he's like in and the worst ogres are the ones that you can't tell are ogres. Oh, yeah, he calls them an ogre, like, 50 times I think, yeah, yeah, <laughs> over yeah. the course of, like, you know? the scenes, yeah. And then when you get to the green team, he calls them straight-out monsters, right? So, you know, I mean, there's just something about that, you know, do, do you smashing think together. there's a reveal at some point of who the Fates Helmet's talking to? I Maybe. That seems important. You know? to. I, I, I'm getting yeah. the feeling that that's going to be an important detail, is, like, why is he telling this like, story and who's he telling it to? Yeah, it would not surprise me if knowing that how much King loves Kirby, if this is some kind of backdoor to Commandy, you know, and maybe Helm's fate is is talking to Commandy, you know, and you know, because Atlas showing up, it feels very much like, like an OMAC kind of situation. 
I mean, the only yeah. thing I'd say against that is that the, mm-hmm. the, the, the hell, it's not like it's in an, un, like an unknown location. It's clearly in a bar somewhere, so... Mm-hmm. You know, so it's on a bar top that the, the helmet's placed at the start uh, before he starts telling the story, so... Mm-hmm. It's definitely not in commandy times, is what I'm trying to say. True, true. I mean, mm-hmm. I'm not saying you're crazy for thinking he's going to factor in somehow, because who knows? Yeah. All, all, yeah, these you're part, right. I, all these parts feel pretty separate, except the two that come together in this, which is the, the trio and the kids. But yeah, you know, now that I look back at the first page, I, I did forget they were in a bar, and it wasn't just Helm's fate. So they had taken out of a bowling bag, too. So definitely not commandy times. Definitely feels like more of that '70s vibe at the same time too. But yeah, I hope you know this definitely felt like a new kind of Tom King story. You know, um, whereas like with Rorschach, that felt very much of its own that had some, um, had some Tom Kingness to it. This definitely feels like more. Uh, there also, you know. there may be a hint on this first page, actually, because uh, yeah. the bartender says, can I get you anything? He says, just a Coke. Now, that could just be meaningless, mm-hmm. but it could also imply that maybe the character is someone who is an alcoholic or something. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Or someone who just we, we know doesn't drink. Right. Uh, no one's springing to mind, but I'm just, you know. No. Uh, given the sort of level of characters we're using here, and and one of the things that's so exciting about these Tom King books is, and so one of the things that I've really come to enjoy about them is how it's elevating just random characters where, you know, not not that like, uh, you know, Adam Strange or Mister Miracle weren't big deals at a time to a certain mm-hmm. audience, but I feel like. For a lot of a modern audience, like those characters were elevated insanely by yeah. those books, and I think it's going to be hard not to get to the end of this and not think of like the creeper as a bigger deal because of his inclusion in this. Uh, yeah. Rorschach's kind of an exception because one, Rorschach himself wasn't in the book; just the idea of him was, and right. Rorschach was definitely a big character. Like no one's disputing yeah. that. Ror- Rorschach's no. the most popular character from no. Watchmen, like without a doubt. Yeah, so. yeah. yeah. But I definitely feel like here is that Jack Ryder is the inverse of the question, right? Um, with the way that he transforms into this, you know, into the creeper. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and we know that the question was, was you know, Rorschach was based off the question. Well, he's, he's also the inverse in yeah. that he doesn't ask questions. Like, he's he's, he's mm-hmm. happy to like just accept what the kids are saying to him so he can get a job. Right. He's like, no, no, I'll just say fluff and, you know, <laughs> yeah. and do my thing. yeah. Uh, and he's leading that to life too, whereas like the question did that to, you know, one fed into the other. Where I feel like the creeper thing is something he tries to hide, you know, because the, there's a whole scene of him cleaning off his face from all the blood, and you know, uh, very very serial killer esque, right? Um, so, but yeah, uh, and we got the nine panel grids here too. Yeah, it's just not, it not on every that. page. It's, it's all it's not no. as consistent, but it's it's definitely there mm-hmm. throughout occasionally. Yeah, uh, so. Yeah, Farn is killing it. The art is is phenomenal. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the expressions are great. Uh, there's a lot of personality in a lot of the faces. It's it's and Farn is mm-hmm. much like Rorschach. It's got that muted kind of vibe to it, where it's not, you know, overly cartoony or anything like that. It's it's very restrained, yeah. and I think that that lends itself well to when you do have a like a name panel grid page that's just Jack Ryder doing these like news like you know mm-hmm. like audition where he's saying a bunch of stuff. Um, and it's compelling to read because of, uh, in part because of the art and because of the facial expressions. Yeah. So, no, I, I, uh, I liked it a lot. Uh, I, I, I mean, it's hard to like gauge like how great it could be after this first issue. Mm-hmm. But what I can say is I, I was can I found it compelling and I was intrigued by what the three guys were up to before they finally had the helmet out and explained, oh, yeah. we're calling Dark Side because we're getting the Justice League, and I'm like, you idiots, um. You know, yeah, the, the build up. The, the wanting to get the Justice League thing killed me. Yeah, the build up yeah. to the kids' tragedy and like everything with them and the cop, like I thought was kind of sweet and mm-hmm. again built this like sort of relationship where okay, she's going to have to actually step up and protect them later on or, uh, you know, investigate this yeah. and look out because you know, and I I genuinely don't know where it's going, but I'm intrigued by all the threads that it's kind of laying down, and mm-hmm. I think what's fun is that all of these Tom King books, well. There's obviously a kind of a through line that feels like Tom King because we recognize it and we like that in all yeah. of them. They all feel they all have something that's different each of them, right? Um yeah. you know 
Strange Adventures was very different from Mr. Miracle and then it had the two different, you know, stories going at once. Mm-hmm. Rorschach was this crime thing that was all told from kind of hindsight and it was it was sort of doing this uh, investigative thing. This is very different again in that it's doing like, you know, different like threads that are going to come together, but this is this is it, more like a this is more like, like a TV a show kind of structure. Yeah. 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 No, it feels like the scope's a lot bigger than that we had you know, just with this cast of these characters and how they all are. Like, you're right, by it feels like a TV show. Um, you know, so... But it's, it's again, he's he's really good at these type of things, at these smaller characters and um, making us care about them. Yeah, right? they don't feel right? small. When you're reading this book, no. they, none, of, none of them feel small at all. Nope, no. Well, and just the fact, too, like, you know, Warlord constantly, people talk about how much he's, like, he looks like Oliver Queen, and that has a lot to do with Mike Grell, but here he's distinct on his own, you know, like he's definitely his own character, and you wouldn't confuse the two. Um, yeah, so again, just the, those, just the, the scenes that you don't know where it's going, right? Like, just when you think you haven't figured out, something else happens, like the kid getting hit, you know. Like, we knew they were in the same spot, but I had no idea that's where it was going to. So No, no. I mean, I could have, uh, if I had thought, I'd have thought Atlas might end up killing a kid, like if he stumbles yeah. into them or something. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the fact that it's, it's, it's one of these idiots that did it, and mm-hmm. we're going to have to deal with the fallout of that, and does he take responsibility? Do they try and hide it? You know, these are questions. Right. Uh, and, you know, I don't fancy your chances of getting the Justice League if your attempt, which was stupid in the first place, to prove that you were valuable to the Justice League ends up with you killing an innocent child. Yeah. Eh, not good. Look, not looking good on the, the job interview is all I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. made a bit of a boo-boo there. Uh, so. Very Definitely good. irresponsible. Yeah. But I, I think, you know, um, the, the one thing that's mentioned with the green team is that they want to spread the, uh, the word that the outsiders are terrorists. Mm-hmm. And like that's really important to them. That's that's like, the condition for Jack Ryder getting the job is that he has to like be willing to like sell that fact. So obviously, at least Metamorpho is an outsider typically. Uh, I don't yeah. know if Eddie's other characters are typically outsiders, but yeah, that's going to be a thing. So they're 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 hinting at things here as well with that. Yeah, for sure. I'm trying to think who else would be. I'm trying to think of the '70s era of the outsiders. Oh god! And Off I, the top of my head, I can tell you. I can't thing. tell you because it's usually just Katana, Black uh, Lightning, Metamorpho, and the Batman. So, um, yeah, I'd have to look up these the the stories that these are based off of were like these issues that kind of got canceled. It was during the Great Implosion. I kept reading about that DC was just producing way too many books, and so these kind of entered like the the cult comic space. By they canceled them all and then took them all and put all the one first issues together as like a trade and then they would sell that trade and it was like the the canceled comics cavalcade you know and that's where the dingbats were introduced and I think there was even Doctor Strange and a Green Team and all of these and so like it's a deep pull for for um, King to to run with but I wouldn't expect anything else from from uh-huh. that but like Lady Cop I know had. Had at least one or two series on her own. You know, oh, really? I so, thought she asked him she was new. Yeah. No, no, no. Lady Cop goes back to the 70s as well. In fact, her origin was, at the time, I feel like one of the first to do that, to where she saw her friends get killed, and then that led to her to become a police officer. Wait, which, there's, there's a tease in the issue. Yeah. That, uh, there's a moment mm-hmm. where she's sort of thinking about her past, and you just see her lying yeah. in the floor with blood like over her head. Mm-hmm. Uh, yep. So she was in a was traumatic the, situation, yeah. Yeah, and they're calling it like, the wild card killer because he, you know, he's wearing boots and he compares women to a deck of cards uh, and stuff. And so, but yeah, all of these characters, you know, they they kind of they were all out at the same time in the seventies where DC kind of imploded, and so they they threw them all together in these, and it kind of became like one of those cult things that if you could find this book, you know, it was this treasure trove of just weird characters that DC was taking a chance on. Um, and so, like, yeah, you have these dingbats who. From what I was reading, the Dingbats were meant to be a rival to the Newsboy Legion. 
you know? And so that's basically their only appearance in continuity is there's, there's a, a thing that happens with Jimmy Olsen and Newsboy Legion and the, you know, Danger Street Ding Bats. Um, and I think that was Jack Kirby as well. So I'm, I'm excited to see where this goes just to see how it pays off with all of these characters. But I definitely feel like, um, you know, like with Lady Cop taking the lead, I think that's real cool. Because again, that's a, that's a character that was around, but not like one or two series isn't, a lot and a lot of history so for you thinking that she was a new character i mean to even to tom king whatever he chooses to do with her it, it's going to be a new version of that character so um, well yeah i mean yeah. i think a lot of these characters might as well be new i mean right. obviously i don't think i think it's important that they're not and i feel like right. there might even be a meta level to this where mm-hmm. maybe the idea of, the, of like you know what happened at dc in the 70s is going to be like kind right. of like not referenced in the text, but referenced in a sort of meta level where thematically it plays into what's going on with the characters in the story and uh, times of change and maybe the idea that most of these characters are forgotten is going to be like, you know, part of the theme as well of like what they're going through and like this worry of being forgotten or something. I don't know, but... Okay, okay. so apparently this was based off of what was called the first issue special and here are these characters that showed up in the first issue special. Atlas, the Green Team, Metamorpho, Lady Cop, Manhunter, the Dean Bats of Danger Street, the Creeper, the Warlord, Doctor Fate, the Outsiders, Codename Assassin, Starman, and the Return of the New Gods. Every single one of those characters is mentioned or shows up in the first, in this first issue. Yeah. Um, and like um, Jerry Conway created Starman, the Codename Assassin. And then Jack Kirby is on Manhunter, the the Dingbats, Atlas, Joe Simon is the Boy Millionaire. So like, yeah, these all go way, way back. Um, But I think that's really cool. Like, I just found an article that talked that up and I I didn't see this till now. So to know that is there's definitely a meta level going on here that all these characters show up in this first issue, yet they get to go on past that and become, you know, one of... uh, Tom King's, you know, things going forward. But yeah, um, hopefully he gets to some more Jack Kirby type stuff, because I like when King tackles the Kirby aspects, but uh, I'm here just for anything. I think it'll be interesting if there is more Kirby stuff like that, because uh, it's the, the art style is so grounded, and it feels like a fairly mm-hmm. grounded book, despite the fact that you've got, you know, the creeper yeah. <laughs> running around. It feels relatively grounded, kind of like Rorschach, so I'll be kind of curious to see how it balances that that tone with uh, everything else, but uh, no, really good, like uh, everything's really intriguing, and I'm, I'm sort of hooked in. Uh, what are you rating Danger Street issue one, Matt? Uh, I'm going to give this a 9. Yeah. I'm th- I think I'm just going to go with 8.5 for this first issue. I really, really liked yeah. it, and I'm intrigued, um, but I'll just say that it didn't. It wasn't like a complete home run, like say issue one of a couple of the other books, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and part of that is, I think, because it is a bit more ambitious and it's like dealing with all these different plot threads. I think as we get more and I, I can sort of see them how they're tying together, I think it will be quite exciting once mm-hmm. we go down that path. But uh, so I'll go a little bit lower and say eight point five. But obviously the art's fantastic and yeah, uh, there's so much potential in the in the story. So. Uh, there you go. Uh, but that'll take us out of the part of the show where we pick our favorite stuff of the week, favorite panel slash moment, favorite cover, favorite art, and top five books of the week. So uh, we'll start off with panel slash moment, Matt. What do you have? Um, mine's going to be from, from Danger Street, and it's when uh, Atlas shows up. But it's uh, on that page where the three of them are standing, that they're ready, and they think that they've called uh, Darkseid. And you just see this big like person come out of the portal and Warlord goes, who the hell is that? That whole page, I think, is really well done. Um, and then it's revealed to be Atlas, which not who they were trying to get. So, Yeah. Uh, mine's is probably also from Danger Street. It's probably the kid getting yeah. blasted by Starman. It's just it's just a good moment. Uh, FTK. F them kids. <laughs> 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 no, but it was like a turning point in the issue. It was like kind of the, yeah, the dark turn. Sure uh all right uh cover of the week matt do you have uh, and uh oh yeah for sure so i went through earlier this week and looked through them and the one that i ended up picking up uh this week was the uh uh de mayo v 
variant of Superman, son of Kal-El. Oh, uh, yeah. And, That's good. Yeah. They're at the Kent farm, it looks like. And it looks like they got a call. So you got two, two like, lines uh, of the two supers going up with the, you know, leaving their, their disguises behind. Uh, it's, it looks so good. I kind of want to frame that one now. Yeah. Um, I want to give a, a good shout to the Batgirls variant, which is yeah. uh, the Dan Moore variant, which is uh, old school Batgirl and Robin. Uh, you know, nice. Babs in her old outfit with a uh, thick yeah. racing. Really, really nice. I really like it a lot. Uh, but my pick is going to be the regular Danger Street cover with the hand and the red. It's just, yeah. it's just so stark and just sticks out, and it's yeah. just really atmospheric. Um, so. I also like the the regular Batgirls cover because there's this weird abstract art to it where sure. it's where it's um, Steph and Cass meeting like head on also phasing into each other and just what it's doing with the purples, oranges, reds. It looks really cool. All right. Uh, best, uh, art of the week. Kind of hard not to say danger street, right? It's for Yeah, Yep. Uh, I'm also picking danger street. Yeah. We can move on. Uh, all right. Wildcats was a, it was a close second. And I should say close. I would say, second, no, it was, but, it was definitely, it yeah. was easily a second, but it wasn't a close yes. second. That's what I meant to say. Yeah. It was along those lines. All right. Uh, top five books might go. All right. Number one is Danger Street. Two is Wildcats. Three is Superman, Son of Kal-El. Four is Batgirls. And five is Dark Crisis, Big Bang. Yeah. Uh, number one for me, Danger Street. Number two, Wildcats. Number three, Batgirls. Number four, Superman, Son of Kal-El. Number five, Dark Crisis, Big Bang. So uh, mm-hmm. kind of a weird batch of books this week but uh yep. let's have a look and see what's coming next week from dc comics uh so your christmas week episode will well we're not going to do all the books that come out obviously but i'm going to tell you all yeah. the books that are coming out uh you get nightwing issue 99 it's a cool number uh we get mm-hmm. flash 789 we have mm-hmm. dark crisis and infinite earth issue 7 the final issue yep we got batman superman world's finest issue 10 Batman vs. Robin issue 4, which is the issue that's going to be sort of kicking off all of the Lazarus Planet stuff, apparently. Yep. Uh, we get Catwoman issue 50, uh, which we won't be doing, but it is oversized for those of you who are uh, picking mm-hmm. up. Uh, Batman Urban Legends issue 22. Deceased War of the Undead Gods issue 5. DC vs. Vampires All Out War issue 6. Stargirl and the Lost Children issue 2. T- Titans United Blood Pact issue 4. Harley Quinn the Animated Series Legion of Bats issue 3. GCPD, The Blue Wall, Issue 3, and Scooby-Doo, Where Are You, Issue 119. So, that's what's coming out. So, it's actually a relatively yeah. busy week. Seven seven books for me, but I know we're going to have huge conversations about, I'm sure, uh, Dark Crisis 7. So, yes, no, eight for me. I've got eight books, so. Yeah, because yeah. you're also reading the GCPD book. Yep. Yeah, uh, which has been yeah. really good. So I'm definitely yeah. still reading that. But, uh, yeah. So yeah, it's been a hefty week. So uh, look out for that over the Christmas period next week. Uh, if there is any change to when it comes out, it's just because it's Christmas. But uh, yes. apparently, apparently, we may have it out in the normal time. <laughs> uh, so, uh, by all means, let us know what you thought of this week's books uh, in the comments. Like, subscribe, ding the bell for notifications if you're on the YouTube. It helps us out a lot. As does rating the podcast five stars on iTunes or wherever you get your podcast from. Um, but of course, if you want to support all the content financially, you can go over to patreon.com slash TV and support us over there uh, for any amount, really, per month. But at the $5 tier and up, you get access to the show as soon as it's ready, late in the Saturday, uh, as opposed to the launch time on Sunday. So if that's of interest, uh, go and have a look and see if you, you want to support the show. Uh, but that is that is us. So thank you very much once again for watching and listening. We always appreciate it. Keep reading DC Comics. And remember to never get lost in the Speed Force.